I don't, is, is this on? Or just, no. yeah, can it you, is on. Can you pick up everything, Barry?
and you can get in pretty much right by always giving the longest answer. Yes, I to people who you Yes. And even though, you know, we've, we've had sessions, we talk to people about things that can go wrong with this wash choice test, how to avoid falling into those pitfalls. It's very difficult to avoid falling into those pitfalls. Speaking first, okay. Thanks, Barry. Is everything looking all right, your end? Yeah. I put up the um in bed, so it's good. This should be interesting, didn't it? I think a few cancellations because of the weather. Mm. So we've got a couple of people coming. Well, two people coming in on Skype now. 
dragon and another guy. Um, Unfortunately, I have to go to supervisor training thing. Oh yeah. This dragon's talk. Oh okay. Well, it'll be recorded. That's true. You do have to catch it afterwards. Probably take a few days to get it up online, but it will. So yeah. Second February. Oh, okay. I just found out yesterday. Um, so yeah, second February. And then he's away on the third somewhere. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> maybe we won't see much of him for a while. <laughs> but, um, yes, maybe we should arrange actually. Be here on the second. Perhaps we should arrange to do something. Take him out for lunch or something. Um, okay, I'll maybe speak to a few people and see if we can do that. Welcome him before he buggers off again. Yes, because we've never done that for you, and I felt bad because of, yeah, it was just what happens if you get so busy and then yeah. Joey gets so full. Well, the start of September is quite hard, isn't it? Because there's lots of news to this. <laughs> Yeah, but so anyway, let's do that and I'll, I'll, um, I'll set something up. Yeah. All right. How are you doing the time? Um, it is going to do that. So we've got a few minutes. We've had got enough catering. You have to. Yeah, we're catering, don't we? I
That's what I'm saying. Yeah. 
Yes. Apart from that, it's so very I know uh, emails that plan activities start coming into research projects that the base funding to do research yeah. on these sorts of issues. But plan is and we saw it in the So, agile. I was a bit of my time because I'm a part of my work. So, a bit of my time I use um, future learners came a bit of serious time. Hi, could we make a start, please? So, there's a bit of a Hi, um, very nice to welcome you to Edinburgh. My name is Eileen Scanlon. Uh, I'm a professor at the Open University <coughs> Institute of Educational Technology with Mike Sharples and various others. We've been responsible for trying to put together some interesting activities surrounding the Future Learn activities. We've founded this Future Learn Academic Network. This is our second year of operation. We're trying to move up to about three or four meetings a year. All the ones I've been to so far have been fascinating, sometimes for reasons that were obvious for the programme and sometimes for things that came up in discussion. So I'm delighted to see so many people coming to uh, this event and very happy to welcome a larger international uh, participation this time round. Um, plans for the meeting is uh, that we've got a, a number of presentations, either virtually or real, plenty of time for discussion and then towards the end of the afternoon we'll do what has become traditional which is to, to say where next for FLAN. So Mike will give us some um, ideas about possibilities of moving forward and then we'll talk in a bit more detail about um, other events that we're trying to put together. So we're very grateful to Sean for organising the meeting today. So I will take my tea and sit down and let her start. Can, can I just say one thing before I forget, which is that we've also got a Facebook um, groups um, site. So and there's you, interesting and lively discussion on that um, <coughs> around general issues to do with future learn research. So if you're not on the Facebook. Um, so then <coughs> probably best just to mail me my sharples and I'll get you set up with it um, so that you can join the Facebook site. Good morning, welcome. My name's uh, Sean Bain. I'm Professor of Digital Education here at Edinburgh and it's a real pleasure to welcome you all here, particularly given the weather because I know it's been a nightmare and I had a little flurry of emails this morning from people who couldn't make it um, from Glasgow, weirdly. Um, <laughs> but so I'm really glad that there's so many people here um, and it's, it's very good to be able to welcome you. Uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure to host the Future Learn Academic Network event here this morning. Um, we've got a really interesting range of speakers lined up, although we have a slightly sort of complex choreography of media going on, but that's kind of appropriate, I think, given our, um, our subject of concern. Andy Wright um, from Birmingham was planning to attend, but he's had family sickness, so he's going to be Skyping in. So the way it's going to work um, today is we're going to have, uh, we're going to hear from Jeff Hayward first, then we're going to fire up Skype and get um, Andy Wright in. Um, and then we'll have a, a, a smaller group discussion before lunch. Um, and at lunchtime I'll tell you what, where you need to go for lunch. Um, the theme of the morning is it, kind of MOOC futures. Where are MOOCs going now? Future Learn has been going for a year. Um, MOOCs in general are still <coughs> very new. Have they, what's next for MOOCs in terms of um, their disruptive capacity? What's next for MOOCs in terms of our research agendas around them? Um, so that's the, that's the broad theme for the day. And I think the speakers we've got are going to introduce us to that theme and hopefully stimulate us um, very usefully to think kind of creatively about those issues. But I won't go on anymore. I'll, I'll hand over to Jeff Hayward. Um, Jeff Hayward from the University of Edinburgh, our Vice Principal for Knowledge Management, um, <laughs> responsible for driving the, the, um, the Edinburgh MOOCs. Um, and he's going to ask the question whether MOOCs are still disruptive. So Jeff is going to speak for about half an hour and then we'll bring in Andy Wright on Skype and then we'll have a, a questions and discussions afterwards. Okay, thanks Jeff. Great, thanks very much Sean. Um, no, it's alright, I'll um, 
I'll make it work. If you can't make the technology work, there's not much point in standing up talking about online learning, really, is there? Let's face it. Well, that's a hostage to fortune, Chair. <laughs> I've tested it. <laughs> um, okay, so, well, I hope I'm going to talk for 30 minutes. Um, I, most of the time these days when I stand up to talk, I actually find that I'm, I'm, I'm saying pretty much the same stuff. While I'm talking to you, I'm just making sure that my phone has actually got a clock on it so I can see what's happening. Um, which I sometimes forget to do and then I lose track of time. I should have said we are being live streamed as well. Um, yeah. So, you know, bear that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't worry me, but it might worry you. Um, and most of the time I find that I'm talking about the same old things and so this time I decided I'll do something totally different, which of course you then suddenly find that, that you have to sit down and do a serious amount of research around it. But it comes out of the thinking that, that we're doing in Edinburgh and I know that, that all universities are, are, are doing um, and that is, that is where are we going with digital education. <coughs> and, and, Reflecting back over the small number of years that MOOCs have been around and, and going back and looking at the early hype that there was in the media about how they were disruptive, it, it seemed to me that the way that, that we began to, we've begun to talk about them now, the way we think about them, and indeed I say this to people, we don't see this as risky anymore, we just do this stuff. And in lots of respects we've mentally domesticated them. And if you look at the tracks that people talk about, say funnels to, you know, to full-time student recruitment, um, you bring them into your on-campus courses, these are all nice, safe things to do, and they domesticate them in some sense, and therefore de-terrorise them, perhaps. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to go back to the reasons why people thought they were disruptive at the start, and they were very embryonic at that time, and say, what's changed? Has anything changed? And so therefore to come out at the end, hopefully, with a set of pointers which we need to not re-terrorise ourselves about, but we need to keep in the front of our minds as MOOCs, as we treat MOOCs as rather domesticated, <coughs> uh, rather domesticated um, animals. So, let's see if I can make the clicker work. Oh. <laughs> Not really. Okay, so, so maybe, maybe I'm not so slick on the tech, or at least I'm not so slick on clickers. I'll just walk backwards and forwards. Okay, so, so as usual, you deconstruct your, 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 your title and disruption was the first bit of it. And actually it's quite interesting that when you pick up definitions of disruption, and it's very appropriate today, you know, with the train shut up and all that, actually they're seen as relatively minor and, and sort of breaks in process. Um, you know, and, and in a sense, I suppose, the things that you can recover from. But if you, if you look at the disruptive innovation um, discussion that came out of Clay, Christ Clay, Clay Christensen's work, um, where disruption has a different meaning and it's disruptive as related to innovation, it's a very different kind of beast to the way we think about disruption. Um, and, and particularly, if you look at the, 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 the paragraph at, at the top, <coughs> of applications taking root at the bottom of a market and then relentlessly moving up market, eventually displacing established competitors, in other words, in the higher education sector, ours as universities was the, was, was the conclusion. Actually, that is not disruption on this kind of, we'll put it back together tomorrow stuff. Um, and so I took the characteristics that he's got here, disruptive businesses, lower gross margins, blah, 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 and the, re and the thinking that the established communities within sectors have got to these intruders and thought, well, shall we I'll look at higher education and the setting we're in and see whether those sorts of features have actually disappeared um, or whether we actually are still living with them and they're around. And, and, and although I'm always wary about old men, particularly the ones who are about to you know, sort of move towards retirement, doing this doomsay a bit about, about everything, actually, and I shall try not to too much, in general I'm quite um, optimistic about universities. I do feel that those threats are still there and actually, if anything, are, are growing. Okay, so let me see if I can I'll walk backwards and forwards. It's probably good for my exercise. Oops. Fine. Okay. One of the things that that um, was was very evident in what in what Clay Christensen was saying was this thing about about 
um, industries, uh, uh, sectors having a um, having a monopoly position, if you like, a natural advantage, um, and and certainly in terms of universities, the fact that there are um, that they have a power of prestige, but particularly actually, and this was the thing that I noticed here, that the product is hard to measure. Um, were, were the things that I thought, well, I'll take a look at some of that and, and see, what sorts of, see what sorts of evidence I can find, if you like, as to whether some of those things are actually beginning to change so that the disruptions that comes as a consequence of MOOCs actually could cause them to rise in, in this trajectory, and if you like, from this hidden position to move up to take over um, the rest of the... Uh, um, to take over, in a sense, the sector and, and to disrupt us. It, to go back just for a moment to what I said before about disruption and disruptive, it's actually quite interesting that when you decide to Google search on disruptive innovation, you come up with loads of stuff that you look at and you think, that isn't disruptive. All. But in a sense, actually, in this particular one, this is the kind of stuff that we routinely do. And so I think that the problem is that, partly, is that real serious disruptive innovation is actually being rather masked by the use, everybody's use of the term, even if what it just means is change or modification or evolution. And so as a consequence, again, that might lead one to think that, that that the reality is that what we've got is something that the sense is domesticated, something that we don't need um, to unduly worry about. And so as a consequence, we can, um, we can happily move on um, and with, with our lives. So I decided what I'd do is I would go and, and unpick, if you like, the different parts of, of the higher education business to see whether there were aspects of it that were particularly sensitive to disruption because unlike the models which have been discussed as where disruption has really taken place, book selling, music industry are, are two obvious examples, newspapers to be, those are in some senses relatively single, single track businesses and so as a consequence the disruption is just of the business because it is relatively um, simple. But even in the higher education area, our business is actually really quite diverse and the different parts of our business are quite distinct in lots of ways. They almost operate like divisions of a, uh, of a company and they address different markets and they address them in different ways. And so as a consequence, it might be possible to disrupt some important parts of our business while leaving other parts alone. <coughs> And so if you, if you look at, at some of the attributes of what could get disrupted uh, within a higher education setting, clearly there's undergrad, there's top postgrad, I've ignored research altogether, there's the full-time, part-time, residential, the online, degrees versus short courses, price, and, and our bundling of everything um, into, 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 into <coughs> educational packages. And so the question is then, I suppose, disruption by when and disruption by whom? And, and, and I think that disruption by when, and I did try to think about whether it was possible to put times to these and came to the conclusion that realistically I couldn't. And I read a rather interesting thing as I was coming into work on my phone today, which was somebody looking back at his predictions for the year ahead at the beginning of 2014. And he said, you know, it's a mugs game. And that was the title of it. Don't even bother trying because the things actually that, 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 that will come along, you will not be spotted. But it did seem to me that one could actually think about whether different areas of our business might be more disruptable than others or more easily disruptable. And it did seem to me that taught postgrad was probably more, un more disruptable than undergrad. Short courses more than degrees, online more than residential, part-time more than full-time, and price and unbundling actually to some degree are rather closely linked and so probably um, changes in those would, um, <coughs> would um, be, be kind of simultaneous. And then a question of disruption by whom? Well, actually we know that the market has become much more complex and of course the whom 
will actually include universities that do decide to radically rethink how to do their business and go into a different space. And so it's not just them out there, it's actually some of us in here that actually might, might turn out to be significantly disruptive. But lots of players now coming in, and it's interesting actually looking at the discussions of the MOOC platforms with employers and the whole skills agenda, which draws in companies that have got nothing to do with higher education, and, and they're suddenly stepped into that, into that education market. Some of this here about, about the things that might disrupt more easily actually come through in, in, in some of the other things that I'm going to say. <coughs> and I think that one of the reasons why we are disruptable as a sector is that we have a set of features and attributes that actually lead to enormous stability. In, in our systems. We have a set of interlocking features that all relate to each other that actually make us in lots of ways what the outside world sees as sluggish and unchanging and you know bound to tradition and all of that. And and these are some of the factors that I that, that I came up with um, as as the sorts of things that lead us to find it quite difficult to make change. I think actually these two here, interlock curricular and physical estate, for traditional universities at least, are actually real problems for us, that it's actually quite hard to find out how you want to pick. And I think that this one here of risk of action by individual universities, in other words, really stepping outside and saying, we're going to do something totally different, it's actually very, very hard for, for traditional form universities to take that step on their own. And so in a sense, and you see this in the MOOC discussions, and we saw them early in the MOOC discussion, everybody was looking at everybody else and saying, are you, are you, are you doing it? So they had a sense that they actually could edge forward with others. I'm particularly struck, and go back occasionally, to, to a book that came out um, about a year ago, <coughs> 18 months ago, by a guy called Robert Zemsky. And, and actually he's coined in this an expression that's one of those things he wished, I really, really wish I'd thought that one up. Because he has a chapter, and it's in, it's in there, the faculty encamped just north of Armageddon. And okay, so it's a really, really nice phrase. And in some senses, of course, it's terribly cruel and, 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 and not really true. But I think that this bit at the end, which says that there are some who believe that something must be done, but most faculty, and you know, if I think of the conversations I have around with people who are not the people who come to this room, the people who are not the ones who come to e-learning type events all the time, there is this sense of, I'll just sit it out and, and wait and see what happens, you know, change will come. And so I think, you know, those characteristics of deciding there is no burning platform, there is no problem, in a sense was one of the problems that the industries that did get disrupted had actually got uh, sitting around. I think another one, and again this goes back to American writers, I, I'm quoting American sources actually here quite often because they've been the most prolific I think in this area, is Bill Bowen who's a higher education economist and, and the, the Tanner lectures and the book that he produced out of it, certainly the Tanner lectures are well worth reading, but when you look back at what we have done with the technology, unlike other sectors that have brought technology in, what we have done and this is a bit of a cruel over-exaggeration, but I think not a huge one, is we've gilded the lily. We have polished our product and made it nicer and better. I think that to a degree we have in fact managed to get more students through as funding has fallen, but that's been an accidental consequence rather than a consequence we've set out to achieve. And in the European study that, that I'm involved in um, for the EC at the moment about modernizing higher education, we asked a set of questions about could technology be used to get more students through the system with the same number of teachers of the same quality, could it be used to, you know, to, to, use, to use fewer teachers and get the same number through at the same price, questions like that. The community, the e-learning community that we addressed in those questions found them very uncomfortable and they were much happier with questions that said same number of students, same teachers, but to a higher quality, and that's gilding the lily. So in lots of respects, we haven't adopted and looked upon technology as something which would actually significantly shift the way our business runs. And so into that mix, into that mix then, came the MOOCs. Um, 
and, and, and the hype and all of that about them as destructive um, and, and disruptive was there, and I'll come back to it at the end. I'm not going to spend a lot of time analysing MOOCs, even though this is a, a flan and MOOC. I'm not going to spend much time analysing MOOCs. I've got one slide, one particular slide, that I, or a couple of particular slides that sum it up. But I need, I need to pause at the moment to define MOOC, because it is clear, partly from... I, Clear to me from conversations, clear to me from interviews that I've been conducting as part of this study, that the word MOOC is used in different ways. To those of us inside the community, a MOOC is a very specific thing. And we know what a Spock is, and somebody says a moot or a mood or whatever. We've got these things, and we understand that it's not fully online talk courses. It's a particular kind of object. But when you go out and talk to other people about so we're not in the sector, the supplies in government. Actually, you get a view that often they use the word MOOC when actually they mean any form of online learning. It's become a concept for online learning, including the cheap bit as well. Um, and and it's, for some it's a concept of openness, and you see this very much in the European Commission. This is about opening up education. They see the open word quite significantly. And, and it's clearly, and I shall come to one or two slides on that, it's a political instrument at the same time, and it could be other things. So, in some senses, I'm cheating to a degree, because when I say I'm MOOCs disrupted, I actually mean this range of things they are, not just the individual short courses that we run. <coughs> the things that I'm... The, 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 in a sense, the only bit about MOOCs that I actually want to talk about, the, the only parts of it where I'm going to think about them in more detail, came out in a study that Shan Jen did for the Higher Education Academy, because I think in that you see the features of disruptive innovation clearly signalled. One of them is about the fact that, the, that MOOCs are evolving as educational structures as we think about it. You know, we have the C books and the X books, and it's, you know, it says quite clearly, C and X has gone, it's blurred. We have discussions about different formats, batching people in busloads or in cohorts, having MOOCs that are always on. So different formats are emerging, and different kinds of ways of presenting educational opportunities under this banner, which is called MOOC. And the other is the teacher as code, the coding the teacher, the automation. And if you look at the innovation that's going on, and there's a biz meeting I'm going to next week, which is on disruption and small technological innovations, that if you look at the developments that are going on, people are producing ways of doing new things online without the teacher presence or with a minimum teacher presence. In other words, the low quality initial product that everybody poo pooed at the start, and in some senses rightly, because it sat way down on that quality and, and etc. ladder where the innovation start. This is it beginning to grow in quality and power. And, and we should be careful that stuck in many people's heads when you say MOOC is the view of the original early ones in computer science only rather unsophisticated, and the truth is, actually, they're increasingly not being that. So we are seeing that innovation begin to come in. I went back to 2012, which was the kind of the early days when, when, when I wound up talking about MOOCs a lot and, and, and trying to explain to people about impact. And, and so I tried to decide where the impact of of MOOCs had actually been, and where its influence was, if you like, and let me just put all of the bits onto that slide. And at that point in time, I reckoned that the media were the place where you'd seen most impact. And there was a relative, you could see that presidents and VCs and principals were talking about it in their groups. And you could see that there was a bit of interest in government its agencies. But I think if you update that to now, to 2015, this one, the media interest has clearly declined substantially, apart from some bits of the educational press, but the general media, if you, if you Google for MOOCs and Financial Times and New York Times, you find nothing at all. The president's bit, I think, is probably still there at a similar kind of level, maybe higher, but I would have another two stars onto governments and agencies. And that's MOOC in the sense that I've used it of a multiple set of meanings, that the impact there is rising. 
We know that students themselves are taking MOOCs in increasing numbers. It's hard to know what the impact there is. It's hard to measure it. We know they're rising. The faculty bit, I would say, has risen a little bit, so I'd give it a star. But I bet that if I walked <coughs> around this campus in this university that's heavily involved and talked to individual random academics about MOOCs, I'm not sure that I will get an engaged, positive understanding. I will from an increasing number, but it's still relatively modest. And this is in a university that's very active. I think also this bit that I had at the bottom, which is that this was very European-centric, um, uh, so Western-centric, and, and, and this was largely unknown. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. I, I think that, that now, actually that bold just goes all the way across. This is just impact right across the board. So we can see that impacts have shifted. They are changing. The hype has gone down, which is, which is scary in a sense, but the impacts in some significant areas are going up. So I'll talk for a few minutes about MOOCs as a global phenomenon, because, of course, in the early days when they began, and this is still true in many people's heads when you talk about it out there, they say Stanford and MIT and, you know, Coursera and whatever they call the other one or the other way around. That's still deeply in their heads. The MOOCs were seen as a U.S. elite, Ivy League university beast. And, okay, so some of the rest of us were in it and they're conscious of that, but nevertheless it had that dominant feel. But actually, if you look at the trajectory of the MOOC platforms, they are now heading to a point at which they will have perhaps more partners in them from the rest of the world to their own country. Um, and, and indeed to their own region. And so as a consequence, the universities across the world are actually winding up in this, and it's reaching a point at which you can see that it isn't, as I actually thought it might have at the very beginning, suddenly going to fade away. Because that number of commitments to it and that sort of global spread isn't going to change. And then if you look at what's happening in individual <coughs> countries, <coughs> China is a very clear example. <coughs> Platforms for their universities platforms that are tiered to fit, explicitly tiered to fit their higher education system. It was as if the Russell Group had decided to set up a platform and, you know, the 94s had decided to set up, etc. They've actually got these platforms and the government is clearly supporting and funding their universities to move into that space. And indeed for them, therefore, these things will really grow. <coughs> Plus the fact, of course, as you can see there, that they're actually focusing very much on that very widely distributed audience of, of people who speak Chinese. The same truth for the Arab platforms, and actually this one, Rock, makes the point. You cannot, unless you can read Arabic, you cannot figure out what the hell is going on in there. I had to get, you know, one of my PhD <laughs> students did the translation for me on that one, because you can't tell what's there. So the point is that a lot of this stuff is actually largely invisible to us. If you go into Google and hunt for it, you find it really hard to find some of this stuff. It's essentially invisible. So it looks to us as it though it isn't happening, despite <coughs> the fact it's actually having significant impacts worldwide. And then the next aspect of MOOCs then is MOOCs as politics, as I've described it before. And so um, I put FutureLearn first. Um, <coughs> David Cameron, Future Learn, part of a visit to industry. This is MOOCs as politics. This is Future Learn, the UK platform, as part of the political process. And of course, you see exactly the same thing happening in the European Commission, that they're bragging about how many European universities have got MOOCs, actually, regardless of which platform they're on. And an increasing number of those platforms are actually European, although very small. And then another one, exactly like, like Future Learn to India, of the State Department using MOOCs as a quite clear instrument of US soft power. And of course, this absolutely is play, plays into the hands of those people who feel that this is intellectual colonialism, that this is, that, that this is the imposition of an external uh, higher education system on their own. And of course, the emergence of, 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 of home country platforms uh, will undoubtedly come up as a combat to this sort of um, what's seen as McDonaldization or, or And then the next point I wanted to look at in this context is about the student populations at HE. And, and, and maybe I'll say this before I show you the data. It's quite interesting that when you read the debates and discussions around online learning, particularly around the MOOC debate, you find, and, and I do this all the time, you find that everybody slips into a model of the three to four year residential degree for 17 or 18 year olds. 
it, it, because our business is so complex, it's quite hard to talk about the whole of the business. And so when they talk about higher education, sitting in there is not the complexity, but it's simplified down to this gold standard of the residential short period of time for young adults. But when one looks at where we are currently, and it's signalled in that, in that white paper from the... Um, from, from this, that even for undergraduate, entry to higher education does not follow the normal routes into a full-time residential degree. And when you look at the data, it becomes starkly obvious that that is the case, because if you look at the UK, and you look at PGT, and even undergrad, very substantial numbers of APCA people in the higher education system, as it stands, actually are studying part-time. And very many, an increasing number of those, actually are not on campus at all. And when we look at our online master's degrees, of which we've got about 60, almost everybody in those programs is part-time and working. Whereas if you look at our on-campus programs, the vast majority of them are full-time and not working. So they're very different populations coming in. Um, age two that the part-timers are much older, and so that 17, 18 year olds going into a first degree is mostly, you know, increasingly not true. I couldn't find any HESA data for the number of people who were studying in the UK at a distance. I think it's probably there as footnotes against the OU, as it happens. Um, although it's interesting that there's a very detailed study done of transnational education about distance learning outside the UK, but it makes all, there's no measures at all about how much it's happening inside the UK as far as I can see. In contrast in the States, the American equivalent of HESA, and this is where I drew the data from there, that again, very similar figures in terms of the fact that it's part-time, so actually this is, this is the, the disruptable part, <coughs> but the substantial increasing number of people who were studying fully online, and the estimates for, part, for PGT in the US are that approximately a third of students that have been PGT in the US are either mostly or fully online study. That's a huge, and if you like, really hidden percentage, none of which reflects out in this paper <coughs> about the gold standard of the three-year, four-year residential degree. So the truth is that the market that we sometimes think about as the disruptable bit, actually we may be looking at the wrong thing. Of course, the context within which universities can do things varies enormously according to the regulation. And one of the things that, that's come out to me over the years, particularly in Europe, is the extent to which universities and countries vary in the degrees of regulation that government puts on them. But the clear trend there is that regulation is, is loosening. And even in countries where it hasn't, government statements are clearly increasingly beginning to signal what they are. One really significant change recently in the US was this move away from a decades-old way of measuring teaching, of measuring education, if you like, which was the bum seat hour, basically, to something which is actually to the um, redefining it, to the amount of work represented, in other words, the study time, is a loosening of those measures, and actually comparable things changed in Spain where you had contact hours legally imposed upon you as an academic, which meant face-to-face -face with a class. Those were removed a few years ago. So we can see that, that release in the legislative control, which made it more difficult for um, other organizations to step into the higher education sector. And so, as we've seen, June 13, papers out of, out of biz, privately funded higher education providers, two of them sitting up there, and as we know probably from the headlines, an increasing number of those students, now that the money has moved to the students and not to the institution, an increasing number of those students are actually studying at these non-traditional, uh, non-standard university providers. The bit below the line is the invisible bit, because people who decide to study with Kaplan or University of Phoenix and live in the UK are not eligible to funding and therefore effectively unmeasured unless you decide to do a research project. So the amount that goes on here is just assumed to be small, although actually I don't know, that there is no evidence one way or the other as far as I can see that tells you whether it's not. So that could rise without one even noting. And then the next thing that is coming through, and, and we see this uh, actually both within the UK, but particularly clearly in the, in the US, 
and I actually found a touch of it on the OU site, <coughs> it is, is, a, is a distinct shift to thinking in terms of competence-based <coughs> education. And when you think of the skills agendas that government have got, and this is true for the European Commission, you read what education is about, and skills and the economy are the dominant themes. They are for the UK, they are for the US. There's a strong interest in that development of skills, which doesn't just mean, as we often treat it in universities, to mean low-level skills, how to type and how to do plumbing. These could be skills all the way up the hierarchy to the most complex synthesis creation analysis. That, that there's an increasing interest in, in the US in competence-based based education, and some of this is coming through here. And the radical bit, and I'm sorry that the writing is very small, so I'll actually read that bit for you, because this is the key bit sitting in it. Transitioning away from seat time in favour of a structure that creates flexibility allows students to progress as they demonstrate mastery, regardless of time, place, or pace of learning. And one of the things I felt increasingly strongly over the last few years is that if you were looking for taboos in the higher education sector that we might have to break to deal with disruptive innovation, one of them would be the academic year, and the other one would be you have to wait till December the 6th until you can sit the exam. In other words, you can't sit it when you're ready. And so that is actually, if you begin to implement it, a serious and, and substantial threat although at the same time opportunity to the way that we do our business. And it makes sense to the general public, and it doesn't surprise me because when I've had discussions like this, I get exactly that same sense. It makes sense to the general public that learning that you get from other places and competences that you've got, however you've got them, should actually be evidenceable and credentialable. They don't treat learning within the university setting as a special uh, gold standard. Increasing number of people actually feel, and I think I, I agree with them a lot, very much, that breaking away from that standard way of doing stuff and recognising those is, is, is important. And then finally, I think, we've, it goes back to the point that Clay Christensen made at the beginning, that we have no measures that can be used to effectively demonstrate how well we do our job. We've struggled with proxies for a long time. But what we can see emerging within the international sector, and that's particularly true because of things that OECD is doing, is a search for ways to produce comparable measures that you could use to assess how good graduates are. And the closest analogy, and particularly in OECD in terms of where there is testing, which is internationally recognized, and which governments brag about when they do well, and really angst about when they do badly, is PISA, which is the one that's used at school level for testing schools people's skills. Testing graduate skills in a similar way, in a globally competitive fashion, would be a real significant shift for us, and it would allow anybody who produced higher education output, if they could demonstrate that they were better than you as traditional sector, they actually would have a very powerful tool in their control. And that thinking is not just US based, if you look at the learning gain interest that, that's present now within BIS, and I think has therefore moved into an interest area for Hefke, it came that way, not from Hefke to BIS, but from BIS down to Hefke. An interest in saying, can we measure learning gains? Objective measures that you could use to compare, if you like, the value for money of different educational processes. And, and something which we've actually really had almost nothing of. And so, to conclude, you go back to the headlines from 2012, and you've got this disruption, disruptive innovation, the sense that it's the beginning of the end for traditional higher education. So if you put together a list, and so this is my personal list of the things that say, and are the conditions similar to those that Christensen describes, free short courses regarded in the sector as low quality, a low price point for add-ons, rapid technology and pedagogy innovations, most of which are, are, are unseen by, by the traditional uh, academy, Large scale, wide reach, long tail audiences, so that you don't have this problem of, 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 of 
of only treating small groups, high flexibility, free from time, place. Courses of this kind fit well with the government and commerce's skills agenda. Interest from employers, the on market, and we can see this in their interest in working with, with the platforms, a rise in interest in competence-based education, government's interest in measuring learning gains, the reg regulations easing to allow new entrants. This, which I consider still important, the lack of a burning platform problem, really lack of a burning platform problem in so far as we see in traditional HE, and we actually maybe continue to polish our existing product, <coughs> not seeking to do the things that in a sense that people would like to be seen, which is to say, hey, and Tim will hate this. No, I won't say it, we're being streamed live. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end. <laughs> I think you've raised loads of questions that we're going to keep circulating back to as the, as the day um, moves on. What I'm going to suggest is because we have Andy Wright um, waiting on the other end of Skype to talk to us, um, that maybe while Derek, if you're here, if, while you call Andy up for us, that would be great. Maybe um, if anyone has any immediate questions for Jeff now, that would be great. And then we can raise some of the issues that he's talked about um, after Andy's talk in our discussion uh, groups. So, does anyone want to ask Jeff something? Jeff? Um, about a year and a half ago, a year ago, I was quite cheerful about the idea that people sort of thought of books as being anything to do with online learning. Because it, it felt really useful, because you could start a conversation about a lot of different things when people would raise the question of books. But I'm wondering whether that moment where that's useful, a useful misunderstanding, has kind of passed um, if we really want to talk about a whole range of different things. Uh, I mean, I, I think that you're probably right, it, and, and it certainly was an advantage because it opened doors and you could then have conversation, you could start saying, let's not talk about MOOCs, let's talk about this other stuff and then get to MOOCs, and, and, and I certainly did that a lot. Um, actually, you're not going to roll it back, I mean, in the sense the genie's out of the bottle in that sense. The term is out there, it's neat and easy to use, and lots of people have it kind of attached in their heads that, that this just means online courses, short online courses, and, and cheap usually, not necessarily free, but, and so that is what that means to them, and you're never going to roll that back. So the question really, I think, is to accept that and recognise it's there, and then you engage with the debate knowing that you will have to use their definition when you're talking, and, and not stick to the Chrissy academic purist one, and say, oh no, you mean a spot, forget it. <laughs> they mean it. Anyone else? We've got time for what, another question. I think we're still. She's pretty much ready to go. So just, yeah. In that case, let's let's um, give Jeff another round of applause. <laughs> so I'm really happy that Andrew Wright from the University of Birmingham was able to come in by Skype. He was intended, as I say, to be here today, but um, he's got illness in the family, so he's having a little bit of a um, about good mood, bad mood, the return of the mood, the turtle. Um, so what I think the way we'll manage this is that Andy, Andy is going to talk for about 20 minutes and then because he then is going to disappear off Skype, but it was, if there are any questions for Andy immediately after his session, please, please raise them. Um, I should have mentioned earlier that we're tweeting today using the hashtag hashfuturelearn. It's a fairly active Twitter stream, so if you're online and tweeting, please use that hashtag. And on that, Derek, thank you. Hello. Hi, hi, how's it, how's it going? Um, so can you hear and see us okay? I can, yep, I can. Hello. <laughs> hi Andy, thanks hey. so much for making it online. Um, yes, can you see us all waving? Um, I can, I can. Well, when we tested earlier, we didn't have the audio working, but it's working now, so you should be able to hear us for questions after your talk. Um, yep. So what I will just do now is hand over to you and um, give you your 20 minute or so slot to talk to us about good moves. Good mook, bad mook. Okie dokie. Thanks, All right, Andy. great. Well, hello, everyone. Um, 
First of all, sorry that I, I couldn't be there today. I've got a, a poorly mummy and a, and a six-week-old daughter to look after today, so um, I wasn't really in a position to make the trip up to Edinburgh uh, last night. Um, sorry if my slides jump around a bit. Um, it's been slightly tricky to focus at home the last few weeks uh, for obvious reasons, um, and I wasn't expected to do it like this, so I haven't really included any animations or anything, so it might be a little dry, um, but I'm just going to go through those slides uh, on here and, and, and uh, then take some questions and stuff at the end. So I'll just set up the slide share. Okay, can you see that slide okay? Hi, sorry, could you see that, yeah? Yeah, we can see it fine, thanks, Andy. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the little thing of, of you guys froze in the top corner, so I wasn't sure. Okay, I'll just go ahead anyway. Um, Andy, we can't see the slide anymore. Could you go back to slideshow? Yeah, no, no, I've just flipped, I've just flipped back between. Oh, I'll, okay, uh, thanks. I'll, I'll put it up there. Okay, so uh, welcome to Good Move, Bad Move 2. Uh, I don't know. If any of the guys who were in the, the, the last plan in Southampton may remember Good Mook, Bad Mook 1 and then may therefore be familiar with the little guy in, in the bottom left-hand corner. I thought I'd uh, bring you back out again for one last hurrah. Um, my details in the middle there if you need to get in touch with me to talk about any of this stuff after the meeting or, or any point. Um, so I'm just going to talk about uh, a, little, a few different things today. Uh, first of all, I'm going to look at um, a workshop that I ran in Shanghai about MOOCs um, and how that ties in possibly with some of the, the concepts that I talked about with the MOOC turtle in the last flan. I will go over that again for anybody who wasn't, wasn't there, who has absolutely no idea what I'm talking about right now. Um, and then going to have a, a quick look at some of the things that Birmingham are doing in terms of our MOOCs um, and then sort of intermix with those will be little bits about uh, various avenues for potential evolution of the model uh, and integration of the model into, into other educational contexts. And then um, obviously there'll be some time for, for some questions at the end. So uh, the workshop I ran was entitled MOOCs Under the Microscope. Um, to give a bit of context, it was in September, uh, hosted by Fudan University in Shanghai. Um, and uh, it was a U21, Universitas 21 Health Sciences annual meeting. Um, so we had about 30 people from around the network in there. Um, and with the, the format of the session was basically that they were broken down into to small working groups um, to create posters on various topics. Um, and then the posters were magic whiteboarded to the walls, which still amazes me um, that you can do that. Um, and then each, each group kind of presented their posters, their, their, their thoughts and their findings. So the final topic was direction and drive, which is why I'm talking about it today, obviously, because that, that bears some resemblance to the concept of MOOC strategy futures. Um, and it was framed, this was only suggestions of mine of what they could talk about. It was completely, they were free to talk about whatever they wanted, but um, I framed it in these kind of three areas. You know, how is it good for students? If it is, how is it good for the university? And how is it good for society? So how are MOOCs, you know, why, why are they good? Why are they worthwhile? And these are the posters that were created by, by the groups. Um, so I'll just summarise. Uh, I'm going to concentrate here on the bits about why it's good for the university as we're talking about um, strategy futures and, and how universities might be planning to use MOOCs in the future. Um, so we've got a lot of a lot of things that people have talked about before. A lot of a lot of obvious stuff: um, raise awareness of knowledge and institution, attracts students, academics, and funding, publicity, engagement, uh, reuse of learning objects, innovation. Uh, enhanced popularity of school, communication between different universities, so collaboration, um, benefit to universities down in the bottom there, reputation, recruitment, brand value, um, and in the last one, opens doors to learners, um, gives the university progressive image, that whole must have a MOOC in order to be seen to be, uh, to be anyone these days. Um, and then uh, benefits for leadership and vision, new areas of expertise uh, and things like that. Um, so what I thought was qu quite interesting about that um, was how neatly some of those things that were brought up, I, they'd not seen the turtle, um, I should point out. I didn't, I didn't introduce them to, to the turtle at, uh, at any point. Um, but a lot of the concepts, obviously, the, the things that other people at other universities are thinking about tie in quite well with, with, with these concepts. So I should just go through this for the, for the people that weren't at the last meeting. This 
Moot Turtle was uh, just a silly little visualisation of mine that I used to come up with some success criteria for MOOCs um, that we talked about uh, in Southampton. Um, and these acronyms stand for um, retention in the bottom right there, research, reputation, recruitment, and revenue. Um, so a lot of those things were touched on, obviously, in the posters that were created independently in, the, in that Shanghai workshop. Um, and this is the social butterfly in the bottom here of philanthropy and social policy, who we also met last time. Uh, as a result of that workshop, I thought that there was something else that I ought to add to the turtle. Um, and I wasn't sure where I should add it, so I've added it to the, to the tail, but that is reuse. Um, and I think that's quite a big one. I think it kind of ties in with, with research, you know, educational research in a way, in, in the way that you can use it for, for different things and you might want to experiment um, using MOOC materials in different contexts and stuff and see how that goes. Um, but so I've added a, a little tail on here. And what I'm going to do for the, for the remainder of the talk is just go through um, under some of these headings um, and having a look at what we're doing and, and what people might want to consider doing or maybe are already consider doing, uh, considering doing. In terms of recruitment, obviously, that's relatively straightforward. Uh, this is just an example from our College of Arts and Law at Brabham. Um, the Hamlet and the Much Ado About Nothing MOOC. Hamlet's obviously run a couple of times. Much Ado About Nothing is, is running this year. And the Aviation one um, ran the end of last year. So there's obvious sort of target um, um, undergraduate and postgraduate programmes that, that we're hoping that we will attract students to by running these MOOCs. You've got all the English ones there. And the, 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 the distance learning military history and you know, MA and air power and stuff, which is obviously a, a very obvious link there between, uh, between the MOOC content and some of the subject matter of the, of the official formal courses. Another th way that I was th thinking about in terms of recruitment um, is kind of MOOCs as, as these kind of bridging and sort of additional or supplementary little bits of, of, of courses or, or material. Um, this is sort of harnessing the marketing and educational sort of power of, of, that MOOCs have that, that some other courses don't necessarily have. These three are just models that I, I came up with on the fly, really. So you've got the, the recommended reading kind of model where somebody has maybe somebody's already signed up for a formal course or, or they're, they're thinking about signing up for a formal course, you, you'd say to them, well, go and do this MOOC, get a flavour of it, see what you think. You know, it's totally informal. It's totally, it's, it's not credit bearing. It's, there's no cost to it. You just go away and, and read it as if it were a textbook. You know, you, you do the MOOC as if it were a textbook, a bit of introductory learning or whatever. The try before you buy is a sort of a slightly more, you know, slightly more targeted, a bit, bit more pushy in the sense that you, you maybe give them a little bit of a module um, as, a, as a dip your toe in the water kind of thing, get a flavour of the course. As that is a part of a module, you could potentially formally accredit it um, with all the administrati administrative stuff and everything you'd have to go through for that. But that's how it differs slightly from the recommended reading kind of thing. And the prerequisite thing would actually be a kind of you have to do this MOOC and get the certificate or you have to do it and get the accreditation of the first five credits or ten credits or whatever it is um, that you because it's formally accredited, you could probably charge for that. So you could say, in order to, you know, it's like an, a knowledge audit almost, and says, do the first 10 credits. Once you've got the certificate for the MOOC, you've got the theory or whatever, then you can come along and do the practical, or you can come along and do the rest of the course. But we'll get, you know, you will have that first 10 credits. So it kind of ties them into the course that way as well, I suppose. Um, in terms of reuse uh, that I mentioned, adding in earlier, um, Dr. Alison Cooper at the University of Birmingham is, the, is the, the lead educator on the three good brain, bad brain MOOCs. And she's a neurobiologist, neuropharmacologist. Um, that's her specialty, which is a very broad and very applicable field to an awful lot of medical courses. So this is almost all of the courses <laughs> that are offered by the medical school. Essentially, we don't have a, 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 lot, a massive portfolio of programs in the medical school. We have very large cohorts in some courses. But this sort of shows the kind of the, the potential power of MOOC materials to be used effectively around a whole host of other programs, undergraduate, uh, postgraduate programs. And why would you want to do that? Potentially, that's going to make it easier in that conversation that you have with, with budget holders, with, with senior members of staff who are asking why you're spending all the time doing a MOOC. If you can show that MOOC materials can then be translated and used in your, your regular VLE to, to improve and enhance um, blended learning, um, online aspects of modules and things like that. It also trains and develops academics in the use of 
technologies to create these kind of multimedia resources and to, to create these kind of courses and of course gets them thinking pedagogically about the best way to put things across online and see what works and what doesn't obviously huge amounts of data from MOOCs to refine teaching um, there's a potential to reduce teaching hours in the long run by minimizing information transfer repetition of, of, of information one-way information stuff um, and thereby encourages and enables flipped and social learning in the sense that you can use the video materials in much the same way that you might use um, a lecture capture or something to give to the students beforehand little bite-sized chunks watch it on the bus watch it at home um, come to the lecture with that knowledge and then let's talk about it let's instead of having a, a lecture theater full of lots of people who say nothing to each other let's let's all interact let's have a baseline of knowledge when we go into the room and then build on that knowledge from there and construct knowledge in that kind of constructive way, uh, constructivist way. This is another example of, of how we're reusing it. This is an MSc in advanced general dental practice um, that I developed and that, that I manage. Um, and we originally, the, pho the photography and practice unit um, was done through, uh, it, it all sits in Moodle, but it was done through Articulate Storyline. Um, so you've got these lectures uh, that you can see on, on the left here with, with your, your options, your pause. Your, it's all very nice and, and the functionality of Storyline is great for this, for this kind of audio narrated lecture. But we've actually given all our students um, from every cohort of the, of, the, of the distance MSc and everyone who's doing the campus, the classroom based MSc as well, access as reviewers to the most recent run of the photography um, MOOC, the dental photography MOOC that we've done. Um, Interestingly, we've we've given them we haven't forced this upon we've given them the option and said if you sign up for future learn let me know and I'll I'll add you as a reviewer. We've actually only had three or four of the students to actually go ahead and take advantage of that. I don't know we haven't we haven't asked them why that is yet we haven't looked into that at all but I don't know if that has any kind of implication um, in terms of what that you know they're totally happy with the storyline and they don't feel that they need this extra kind of more video based uh, MOOC um, experience to to enhance their experience. Who knows? I, I I wouldn't like to say at this point, um, but there is talk that you know we prefer the MOOC materials. It's more current. It's nicer looking, and there is a desire I think in the school to to eventually replace the old unit fully with just go and do the MOOC, um, you know, and then come back to us and you and you've essentially done that unit. You still have to do the the formal assessment um, that's attached to that unit, but you'd get all the knowledge through the MOOC. Uh, final one on reuse, but also kind of falls into the reputation category. Um, good brain, bad brain is is going is going global. Obviously, it's MOOC; it's already global, but it's it's moving to Brazil uh, and is going to be translated into Portuguese and hosted by Viduca, who, in uh, in Alison's words, seem to be some sort of Brazilian future learn. Um, I don't know that much about them, uh, but there's a link here if you wanted to have a look at Viduca. Um, but obviously there's benefits here for, for Alison personally and for the university. We've got a lot of strategic collaboration stuff with Brazilian universities, Sao Paulo included, um, and this potentially strengthens that bond. In terms of revenue, this this one I just wanted to flag up. I was, I, I'm currently doing a, a, a master's course myself at Sheffield Hallam, um, and my tutor, when we were talking about MOOCs, just pointed me at this and said, did you know that we're doing this? This is their CPD Anywhere um, thing that, that, that they're offering now. It's a healthcare thing for CPD. Um, but what I really like about this is they, they've got these strands, which are CPD Online, CPD SHU, which is the, the live stuff, the, the, you know, the on-campus stuff, CPD Bite Size and CPD Consultancy. So the MOOCs fall into the Bite Size category. Um, but what I like about it is, that, is the holistic nature of this. They've basically got MOOCs have been integrated fully into a into a whole kind of CPD offering that you can just go on the website and have a look at everything they do and it, it caters for whatever you're looking for in terms of healthcare CPD provided obviously that it's that the that the subject is, is offered by Hallam University you can go in you can just do the MOOC you could do more formal verifiable accredited CPD stuff um, and all and all that kind of thing so I really like how they kind of how they've branded that and how they've kind of made it a holistic kind of healthcare approach. A bit more on, on revenue. Everyone probably, I would imagine, has already heard of, of Spocks. Um, I thought clocks might be quite a nice one along this line as well, just because, 
it's a word, essentially. Um, but in this context, I'm talking about potential future use of, of the FutureLearn platform for, for closed courses, which is some people have already started talking about this. They'd be invite only, possibly through staff email distribution lists, um, NHS perhaps, or, or you know, institu big institutions like that who've got training demands that feel that could be met by MOOCs. Um, and when we talk about these, I think a lot of people are talking about having um, a more expert and faculty presence to give a richer experience in these courses. So if people are going to be paying for them, um, then they ought to stand apart from the free offerings in some tangible, meaningful way educationally. Um, and this is one way that people that I've spoken to have, have been considering. In terms of how the payment would actually work for that, I'm not entirely sure, so I've just put all the options here. Um, you could have an enrolment fee that could be paid by the student. It could be paid as a group of students by their employer, for example, or the employer could employ the university to develop the course and then provide the project funding. Um, so there's two kind of different ways of looking at that. One thing I would say is just a little note of caution. There's nothing new about non-massive closed online courses. The MSC I run is a non-massive closed online course. You have to pay for it. There aren't that many students. Um, the MOOC community dynamic is currently is unique because it's massive, because it's open. Um, for example, on our medical courses, we have healthcare professionals, patients, family members of patients, students studying related disciplines, and what I like to call voyeurs, uh, people who just pop in for their own interests, whether scientific or pedagogic or whatever it is. I think the danger is that if you start selecting particular groups of people, you lose this kind of community, the diversity of that community. Um, last point, obviously, if, if Future Learner is considering moving into the area of closed online courses, then they're putting themselves into a position where they're sort of more in direct competition with people that or, who've been doing that for an awful long time, so Moodle, Blackboard. They already have a lot of tried and tested pedagogic and administrative and management functionality that caters for non-massive cl and closed formats. So just something to think about maybe going forward there. However, it does, it does seem that people are going to be definitely considering this kind of thing. Um, Mark Lester in the October uh, Partner Forum uh, Skyped in, I think, and did a talk on healthcare in which he mentioned uh, two strands of potential um, courses that the future might be interested in running, those being patient education and professional medical education courses. Um, and he mentioned partners such as NHS Choices and Healthcare UK. I've, I don't know how the, you know this would work in, in practice, but it's it's, I mean, it's it's interesting and it's something that actually the University of Birmingham are sort of already doing. We've got five medically related courses already. The Good Brain, Bad Brain courses, I would suggest fall into the patient education and potentially the professional education bracket. Um, the dental photography one obviously is, is specifically targeted at professionals, whether it be dentists or hygienists or dental assistants or um, those kind of people, you know, the whole dental team, but professional. And the liver disease course is very much patient education focused, public outreach, awareness raising. Um, so this is something that we've already done. Uh, I think it's, it, it, you know, it would be good for us to use our expertise to, to do more health co healthcare courses. Um, and if this is something that, you know, Future Learn are keen on and, and the University of Birmingham are, are keen on and other universities are keen on, I don't see why there couldn't be a big, you know, very attractive kind of healthcare portfolio up um, through the Future Learn platform. In terms of research, um, coming back to the, 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 the turtles headings, um, the lead educators on the liver disease course and myself are currently working on a, a paper that will hopefully be submitted to the Journal of Hepatology in 2015. Um, so that will be on, around that kind of public outreach, patient education, public awareness of risks of and treatment of liver disease. Um, it's not just alcohol, you know, that kind of thing that's, you know, trying to, trying to get rid of some preconceptions around the liver um, and whether that's, whether the MOOC has been a successful way of doing that and comparing it hopefully to other other sources of information on liver disease either online or not and whether MOOCs can be considered more or less impactful or powerful than than, than the existing resources um, and another thing that I just I just wanted to quickly mention this is just just uh, for myself really um, 
I'm just going into the dissertation phase of my master's in technology, enhanced learning, innovation and change. And I, and I want to do something around MOOCs. Obviously, I'm, I've been working on MOOCs now for over a year and, and it's a big part of what I do. So I've come up with a draft research proposal, something around analysing the impact, as I mentioned earlier, of the diversity of those MOOC learner communities um, on the achievement of learner goals. Because I really want to have a look at um, whether... You know, there's lots of stuff on the internet. There's lots of stuff not on the internet. Are MOOCs substantially um, more? Do they have more impact um, due to the fact that they are massive and open, and that encourages the diversity of these kind of learner communities? Where, for example, on the Parkinson's course, we'd have healthcare professionals talking to patients, talking to family members of patients and carers, talking to students, talking to the academics, the experts that we that, that we provide, and whether that mixture. You know, trying to get some tangible data on whether that mixture of, of people really, really enables the achievement of, of learner goals in this kind of humanist self-actualization, but potentially also professional and vocational um, way. OK, um, so just to summarise, we, we've, we've touched upon all of those things. I hope that Shanghai and the turtle sounds a little less like a Terry Pratchett book now and actually has uh, some meaning. Um, and we talked about some of the things that, we, that we're doing at Birmingham interspersed with a few little random ideas of mine about the way things might go. Um, so I'm totally happy to, uh, to answer some questions now or, or, or for you guys to talk amongst yourselves and I'll just listen in or whatever. Um, I've just stuck a few questions up here to get things to get things moving. So I'd be interested to see what other people's priorities are, what other people are already doing uh, and the things that I might have missed out completely, which I'm sure there are things that people are doing that I've not heard of before. And I'd be really interested to hear about that stuff. So um, that's me. I'll, I'll pass you back into the room. Many, many thanks, Andy. That was fantastic. That was great. Uh, round of applause. <laughs> We're all applauding you. Oh, thank you. Um, OK, Chris, can I suggest before we split into groups then for discussion, does anyone have anything they want to raise in response to Andy's conversation starters? Yeah, uh, there's a question from Tim O'Shea. I'll just pass over the microphone. Um, oh, that's a great talk, Andy. I'd be interested a little bit in your, in your context in Birmingham. I mean, are you a guerrilla? Are you mainstream? How are you positioned? Sorry, yeah, I should have mentioned, I should have introduced myself properly. Um, I work, uh, I'm a distance learning developer um, working in a team of, of well, an educational technology team in the College of Medical and Dental Sciences at Birmingham. So the majority of what I do is working uh, to, to run, uh, develop, run um, a, a formal MSc in advanced general dental practice. Um, and with, with the knowledge that I gained through that, I was the person that, because everything's so informal with MOOCs, that people approach to see if I'd be interested in helping out with, with developing the MOOCs. So I've personally developed and done all the video work and, and, and all the working with the platform and everything for all of the medically related courses that Birmingham have done so far, which is where I get my insight, if, if you can call it insight, from. So you're in a sort of like a mainstream medical ed tech unit? Yeah. I have a question. Um, sure. <laughs> um, I, I guess this is part of the um, agenda for the day, really, but uh, uh, Jeff Hayward, I don't know if you were watching on the live stream, was just asking whether MOOCs are still disruptive. I wondered if you, do you still see MOOCs as disruptive at Birmingham? Can you define disruptive for me? Sorry, I have seen that sentence around. Yeah, something, something that would, would add terribly um, kind of short snappy, but something that would would blow most universities away and make them perhaps redundant, which is, you know, um, innovative disruption. I'm not, I'm not sure it'll have that much impact. I, d I don't think it will, it will render the university redundant um, by any means. I think there's enough, there's enough people in the world and enough scope for the variety of what people want from education for, for formal and informal and non-formal courses all, all to be, to have their place. Thank you, good answer. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> okay, in that case, can we give Andy another round of applause? And thank you very much, Andy. No, that's great. Great. I just, uh, sorry I couldn't be there. Sorry to miss out on the drinks last night as well. Yeah, well, come, an, come another time instead. Next time. I'll be happy to welcome you. Okay, thanks a lot. Will do. Bye. Thanks very much. Cheers, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Okay. Um,
um, been developing over the last year and what should our research agenda be around that as we kind of move forward into the next uh, year or so. I'll put some questions up on the screen, but can I suggest that we sort of cluster in some smaller groups of maybe about 10 or so. Pull chairs around. I'm sorry that this room isn't hugely kind of flexible, um, but just kind of unpack it. And if we can make, um, yeah, make a few groups of about nine or ten, I think that should come. Make three groups of about nine or ten, I think that should cover it. So if you guys up there can sort of cluster in, we might get yeah. another, another group of um, nine or ten chairs. Yeah, and grab coffee as well.
Yeah, we've done two courses since then. We're developing much more um, for 2015.
that an advert, but if any of you want to get as many copies of the line as you can, you can. So, Hello, can you hear us okay now? Yes, I can hear clearly. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to have to... Uh, oh. Hello. Hi there. Hi, sorry about that. Just dropped out. I had to restart Skype. That should be going now. Okay, perfect. Hello, Dragon. This is Mike Sharples. Um, you can hear me okay, can you? Yes, I can. Good. Well, uh, thank you very much for joining us. And for those of you who don't know, Dragon Gratovic uh, will shortly be joining the University of Edinburgh. It's an excellent appointment. Uh, not just for Edinburgh, but for the UK. It's bringing more substantial expertise in learning analytics into the UK. So I'm delighted that Dragon can join us now and over to you on learning analytics and MOOCs. Thanks very much, Mike, and thanks very much for giving me an opportunity to talk to you today. Unfortunately, I cannot be there physically today, but uh, as you mentioned, in three weeks, I'll be joining you there and look forward to that. We're going to talk today about learning analytics and the position of learning analytics, what learning analytics can do for MOOCs, and in general, what we've learned so far uh, with the use of learning analytics about MOOCs, and what more learning analytics can offer in more critical interrogation of MOOCs and general practice of MOOCs. We basically, and I'm pretty sure the group I'm talking today is very well acquainted with the notion of MOOCs and what is the major innovation of MOOCs. Probably many of you are very well aware that really just the scale at uh, which learning opportunities can be provided and offered with many, to many uh, learners in a free and open manner is something that is really the major innovation of MOOCs. Uh, obviously, at that point, when we are able to increase that level of scale, we also are able to reach out to many different individuals. However, with the notion of the uh, scalability, we are also coming with a price that we are potentially losing all those uh, natural cues that human beings have when they are interacting in the face-to-face -face conversation. Basically, we cannot see what are those uh, simple emotional states of our learners uh, at scale simply by examining their facial uh, expressions. Or we cannot really know that through the physical interactions or even closer interaction that is visible uh, through uh, regular distance and online learning when we are teaching students up to 30 to 40 uh, students in the small enrollment classes. Basically, what we want to do and what we want to offer and what we are in a big need in the MOOCs is to decrease these uh, uh, distances that are uh, increased so much with the scale that is introduced by MOOCs so that we can provide personalized feedback uh, uh, for our students, but at the same time also to provide feedback for instructors about the effectiveness of uh, their pedagogies. So in that sense, we see that learning analytics potentially can be used as a rescue to address this issue. And with learning analytics, we really mean by uh, being able to harness the data that is being collected by the existing MOOC platforms. 
Inside of these MOOC platforms, we are presently uh, deploying the learning resources. We are also uh, envisioning that our learners will be taking and completing certain types of activities in different types of platforms, whether we are talking about Coursera, Future Learn, or edX, or any uh, similar platform. However, many researchers are also not seeing that uh, learning should be happening inside of a single silo, such as a, a MOOC platform, but rather that uh, we want learners to move out of that uh, university or institutional or platform controlled space to their personalized spaces that are completely owned and controlled by learners. That's why uh, different uh, pedagogies, especially those that are inspired by the constructivist approaches pioneered by Stephen Downs and George Siemens are encouraging the innovation in a sense of using different social media or social networking uh, platforms. But at the same time, we would like our learners to find different types of resources by using different types of engines or produce new artifacts that basically can help them in constructing or reflecting on the newly constructed knowledge. Of course, we are using also in producing the artifacts through additional types of media through the use of different videos or slides. At the same time, we would like to see collaboration between our students and that collaboration may be happening through different types of Google Docs, etc. What we want to achieve with learning analytics is we would like to harness, harness uh, the digital footprint that our learners are leaving whenever they are interacting with these digital technologies. And whenever we are interacting with these digital technologies, we are always leaving some digital trace. Therefore, the point of learning analytics is, by, is to use um, uh, machine learning, uh, data mining technologies in combination with information visualization to provide and establish these feedback loops that are existing, that are presently missing. In that process, we basically can see that the major trend uh, for many researchers uh, has been so far to use learning analytics primarily uh, to predict how many students will uh, drop out of the course or to understand how many students will uh, successfully finish the course. At the same time, that problem of uh, retention is also complemented with the understanding of how many students will really successfully complete the course and what potentially the grade for some of those students would be. Probably one of the most mature works in understanding of different types of profiles of learners was done uh, uh, by the group uh, out of the Lytx lab at Stanford University, in which they tried to understand what type of uh, learner subpopulations we can identify in MOOCs. In principle, they were able to identify generally four general uh, populations of learners, those who are just auditing, those who are lagging behind, those who are fully on track, and those who are completely out, basically, who dropped out of the course. What is also interesting with this type of work is they were also able to explain how some of these uh, learner subpopulation transition from one state to another state when they are going through the course from one week to another week. We can also see, uh, in general, that trends in the overall mainstream media discourse about the learning analytics are being increased. We recently did a study of the general news coverage of MOOCs in mainstream media by analyzing all the news articles available in the database called Factiva, which is uh, owned by Don Jones Company and typically also used by Thomson Reuters for many different discourse analysis. We can see that there is a general decline, uh, uh, declining trend in the coverage of the MOOCs. However, there are those very few topics which are peaking and which are basically uh, gaining more and more attention. One of those topics is also general uh, analytics and the use of data analytics in MOOCs by basically being uh, able to understand what's happening behind the MOOCs and how we can offer better opportunities for learning in MOOCs. At the same time, it is also interesting to see what are the trends uh, uh, and what plans researchers have in terms of understanding MOOCs? Whether it is really just a, a attrition of students inside of MOOCs is the topic that the researchers are interested in, or researchers are maybe looking for something else. 
We were looking also at the proposals submitted to the Gates-funded uh, MOOC research initiative, which was coordinated by jo George Simmons and was uh, launched in 2013 and completed in 2014, uh, in late 2014. So we pretty much analyzed the text of all the uh, proposals submitted to this MOOC research initiative. And we were identified, we were able to identify four major themes out of those that were submitted. We can see that out of those four major themes that uh, we can basically identify that there are pretty much two topics or two clusters that were interested in, in general student engagement and learning success and also uh, success criteria and the different types of motivations and attitudes uh, that are leading to success of learners inside of MOOCs. However, we can also see that researchers were interested in additional alternative elements, which were also, I would say, inspired by the stronger connection uh, with the existing uh, open uh, learning and online learning research. And those are primarily related to understanding of MOOC designs and connection of MOOCs with different types of curricula. At the same time, also understanding of self-regulated learning and social learning with MOOCs and also the use of social network analysis and network learning inside of MOOCs. It was especially interesting to see out of all these different themes that the proposals which were submitted in these two clusters, uh, cluster three and four, which were uh, focused on self-regulated learning and social learning by, mean, by the use of social network analysis, they were also the most successful ones. Probably this is also something that is giving us a kind of a slight insight that researchers are interested to see what is really happening uh, in terms of the agency that students are taking and how students are controlling their own learning when they are in moves, which basically tell us something much beyond simple measures of attrition of students inside of moves. At the same time, researchers are also interested to see what type of engagement, social engagement trends are happening inside of MOOCs by building on the existing notion that uh, student-student interaction is probably one of the strongest pedagogical uh, strategies that have been shown in different meta-analysis that's, uh, that's been so far conducted in uh, open and online learning uh, literature. Therefore, therefore, the question becomes, is it really that learning analytics uh, can offer us just uh, this notion of understanding of student retention and attrition? And can we really move beyond this simple notion of retention uh, and can go into more qualitative aspects of understanding of learning? Therefore, then the question becomes, what are some of the potential di uh, directions for the future learning analytics uh, research? We can see recently some interesting trends and discussions happening even in social media as a reaction of a recent article uh, published by um, Harvard University's Justin Reich in Science. And basically we can see that many researchers are typically using very superficial measures of learner engagement in MOOCs. For example, the common measure is how many page hits learner, learners had or how many uh, how much time learners spend online. But those measures really do not represent and cannot tell us uh, much about the level of cognitive engagement of learners, nor can they tell us about the level of, for example, the general study preparedness of learners. For example, to what extent learners are really prepared to study online. And it is typically connected with the level of their uh, skills to self-regulate their learning, to be self-directed learners and to be able to rescue themselves in that whole process. And also at the same time to be able to find some relevant information online. We really cannot say even though we are collecting so much data about that general level of engagement. In a recent article which we published in a special issue that Sean Bain and Jen Ross edited in, uh, tech, in tech Trends, we basically argued that we really need to move away from these simple counts of learning. Uh, and the motivation for this is also coming from the general information behavior research, which was done uh, in the field of information science, in which they basically said that, for example, the field of libraries, they counted everything which was possible to be counted from the number of uh, times students went to the library to the number of books they took, and they really couldn't um, understand so much in advance their practice of libraries by simple counting. 
What they actually uh, manage and they report in that information behavior research is with the moment they connected uh, these types of counts with the existing uh, theories about information behavior. In a similar manner, the trend really needs to switch uh, to motivate these measures of uh, engagement and the understanding of learning in MOOCs with the existing theories uh, of learning. And in particular, given that we basically need to connect and collect better types of data, then what types of theories should be used? One of these models that uh, I've been advocating recently is to connect it better with the models of self-regulated learning, simply because learners need to better connect uh, and need to better self-regulate when they are uh, learning online. So in principle, uh, what we basically need to do in that process is, uh, is one of these models that is coming from the self-regulated learning research is suggested by Phil Winnie. And basically that model accounts for uh, five major elements that needs to be accounted for if we want to understand and have a much better and much more reliable understanding of learning at scale. In principle, we need to understand conditions under which learning happens. And when we say conditions, we really need to understand different pedagogical models. If I'm using one pedagogical model in which I'm just using knowledge transmissive model where I'm just providing students with lectures and quizzes, it's one way and it's a completely different way if I'm using an approach in which I'm asking students to socially interact extensively to reflect deeply on the lessons that they had inside of those courses. At the same time, we also need to be able to uh, understand internal conditions as well about our learners. For example, the level of metacognitive skills or the different types of learning strategies that the learners are taking. For example, whether they are using diverse study tools that are available uh, by the affordances uh, that are, uh, which are basically offered by the learning environments in which learning happens, or what are these emotional states. For example, whether students are really uh, uh, getting uh, confused with the information they are studying with, or whether learners are really having strong negative emotions, which can be also a strong indicator of different uh, cognitive processes, as shown, for example, by recent research by Art Kreischer and Sidney DeMello. At the same time, we also want to understand what types of operations and tools students are performing inside of these MOOCs. When we say operations, whether students are just simply reading some pages or watching, or we can also provide deep, deeper engagement, for example, uh, uh, discussions for learners, which are shown to promote, for example, critical thinking skills and deeper and higher order uh, learning skills. At the same time, we, we can do that by analyzing products of learning. And we, these products of learning, we really need to move away from simple analysis of the grades. And grades has been, anyway, and the use of grades has been, anyways, recently challenged in the educational research literature as not so really accurate and reliable measures of learning. By products of learning, we really uh, mean, in this sense, uh, the understanding of, for example, depth of engagement in, say, critical reflections in blogs learners produced, or even the uh, quality of, for example, uh, the, the answers students had on different types of quizzes. At the same time, you also want to understand what types of standards learners are using when they are evaluating their own learning. With this, we basically mean primarily how well students are able to judge their own learning. To, to that end, basically, we really want to understand uh, whether learners are able to say whether I mastered certain topic well or not. And if they didn't really uh, are accurate in that process, then we really can understand that students are using very wrong standards about that. And we know from the literature on self-regulated learning that learners are really bad at judging their own learning, they are highly inaccurate and they are typically uh, very overconfident. Another basically important then trend in this process to facilitate uh, the analysis of these uh, different five elements is that we need to scale up qualitative methods. And in that process, text analysis and text mining, mining are really uh, the, uh, the areas that can offer much. 
I think the work of Caroline Rosé out of Carnegie Mellon University is quite promising, and she did a really interesting work on the use of these qualitative methods to understand, for example, different types of questions students are asking in discussion forums. And to conclude that, for example, typically when students are asking different types of procedural questions, they are typically also at much higher risk uh, at their learning and successful learning outcomes. At the same time, learners who are much more focused on the questions which are typically about the content and specific uh, items related to the uh, content they are studying, they are much better off and they are typically deeper engaged with their learning. That probably also can tell us also about the level of their skills to uh, find their ways uh, in online courses, but also probably with the level of their metacognitive skills. We also can and should be looking at different types of process measures and to move from these simple coding and counting measures. While it is good to understand how much time students spend, it is, uh, spend online, it is much more useful to understand what was the sequence of activities students had online. And that sequence of activities can basically be in a way uh, to understand to what extent students read some information and then that was followed, for example, by taking some notes or even in the opportunities offered by some learning environments to take some highlights or even to discuss with their peers. And when we are able to understand these processes, we can establish potentially some graphs of the students' activities. And we are seeing in, in some recent research that some of these graphs are really uh, strong indicators of the level of metacognitive monitoring students have in online, online courses. And at the same time, uh, with uh, recent trends in online learning and general basically challenged role of universities, especially with the notion of MOOCs, that we need to have these diversified opportunities for learners. We basically also can see that potentially many universities are looking at this uh, relationship between learners and, uh, and themselves as, a long, uh, and as lifelong. And basically, in that process, we need to understand that we don't really want to have that engagement only to last for two to four years, but rather we see that for 40 years throughout their uh, uh, lives. And in that process, what we need to is basically to have these learner profiles that, in which we understand not only uh, just what outcomes and what is the level of knowledge of our learners, but also to understand what types of processes they used in their learning, but at the same time also what are their general interests and career goals and also what are potentially emotional states when they are studying specific types of topics uh, and what they've done in the past. Many researchers are also seeing the use of uh, visualizations as very useful and very helpful. However, we are very often forgetting that some visualizations can be very harmful. And there is a general trend in learning analytics that many individuals would like to show how one individual student, uh, what is the standing of an individual student with the rest of the class average and the overall class aggregate. However, a recent study at the University of Melbourne showed that, uh, that students, when they are interpreting and sense, making some sense out of these visualizations, are actually finding uh, some of these visualizations really as misleading. For example, students who are in great academic standing, who are high achievers, when they see that they are slightly above the average of the class, they think they are doing well. Although they are really not doing well and they are uh, below the level of their goals and uh, general level of achievement. Therefore, uh, we need to really think carefully about these types of visualizations and think the ways how we can embed them into uh, learning tasks so that they can fit the purpose of promoting different types of skills that are relevant for some of these learning uh, tasks. At the same time, they should not be just uh, measured on simple and superficial counts of, for example, logins into platforms, but rather we really need to account for these uh, five elements that I earlier introduced. And for example, this is one of these potential visualizations where we can understand the types of topics learners are reading, for example, but we can also see that even though students are spending much time on reading, and reading is a generally very inefficient study strategy, and they are not really spending much time on annotating that content, or they are not really spending much time on different types of forums, then we can actually have something which is very actionable for a formative feedback, which can tell students, well, you are really spending much time reading these types of topics, but you are not really deeply engaged in these topics. And here is some uh, possible approach that you can take in that process. 
At the same time, we also need to understand that uh, learning activities do not happen in a single platform. They are, even if they are, if, even if you are using some of these centralized platforms such as Coursera or edX, learners are even setting up their own uh, study collaborative uh, spaces like Facebook, uh, Twitter, and many other spaces. So the challenge becomes how we collect and aggregate data from many of these platforms. But of course, that poses uh, serious ethical and privacy issues. Although I'm keen to collect data from Twitter and most of ethics guidelines are allowing us to use that as the public space information, that is not really quite the case about the data which are uh, being posted by students, for example, on Facebook, which has uh, stricter um, uh, login requirements. But even, even then, to what extent I am allowed to collect some of these data, to what extent students are controlling the data, and they are even aware that we are collecting so much data about them. And what is, even if you are collecting these data, what is in it for them, and what value they are getting from that data collection, and con what control they may have in that process. And finally, we also need to have much more robust methods for um, uh, researching uh, MOOCs in general and also integrating learning analytics in uh, research about MOOCs. Uh, we are seeing potentially that design-based research is something which is very practical paradigm that can be quickly applied to uh, MOOCs. And we also noticed that in the MOOC research initiative, there was a general trend. But at the same time, what we are seeing is that many institutions don't have really policies about sharing data. And if you are analyzing a single MOOC, that's fine. But what we really need to move is to go to more longitudinal types of studies, where we are tracking learners for a longer period of time, in which we can then uh, understand what's happening. But that cannot be done then if you are just limiting our MOOC research on a single institution, which is collecting data. Therefore, some institutions are taking some steps, but we are really far away still from the policies and effective methods to do this task. I'm going to stop at this point on, and I'm going to be happy to take your questions and engage into further conversation. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dragon. That's um, a pretty comprehensive and um, wide-ranging um, talk about <laughs> analytics and the possibilities. Any immediate questions um, to Dragon? Yes. Um, hi, hi, Dragon. That's Tim O'Shea. That was an absolutely superb talk. Um, so if you think forward, say, two or three years, what's the biggest win from the point of view of learners that we <coughs> might be able to secure using learning analytics? Uh, th thanks. That, that's a really great question. And uh, what I'm actually seeing for learners in that sense, and regardless whether we are talking about MOOCs or uh, learning basically on campus is really that learners can, uh, first of all, sense that institutions care much more about them, that we can basically show that learners matter and that they are central to the core business of every single university. And that is basically then something that analytics can show that we basically can understand what are those needs of learners, what are the general trends, and that we can get closer to our learners. At the same time, what I'm also potentially seeing there is that institutions can probably, through understanding of some of these trends and the needs of learners and being able to approach learners closely, we can probably also engage more closely into different types of counseling services, especially related to their careers. And in that sense, uh, learners basically can uh, become much more or feel probably much more central to the institutions and feel much more to the core of what we are trying to do. At least that's basically what, what I'm seeing as something that can be fairly quickly done on a, on a very short term. Great answer. Thank you very much. One more question? Can I just ask <coughs> one question then? Uh, you said that retention figures are a pretty impoverished way of um, using uh, analytics. Senior managers in universities want to get evidence of whether MOOCs in general are successful and worth investing in, and whether a particular course has been <coughs> successful. What would you say would be a useful suite or portfolio of evidence um, that analytics may be able to provide to senior management in universities? 
Uh, thanks, Mike. That's also a great question and obviously a big challenge, and I'm pretty sure there is no easy answer to that. Uh, of course, I mean, I'm challenging the notion of retention simply because the expense for students to enroll into a MOOC is a click, and that's it. There is no really anything deeper. There is nothing big financial or emotional investment. And I can tell that as a serial dropout of many MOOCs. I'm typically never enrolling into MOOCs to complete them, but I'm just going there to see what is the instructional design or maybe to see one or two bits of information that are available there. What many institutions are trying to do there is basically, in general, potentially trends could be in that sense, is how many of these students are uh, seeing uh, opportunities to engage with the uh, university and potentially how many of these MOOC complete, successfully completed learners are basically being com converted into the regular students of the universities. The other thing is uh, some other universities I'm finding what EPFL is doing is quite interesting is basically identity building and it's basically in their case they are actually trying to do that in a long term in a strategic way where they basically went to the space of uh, Africa and the goal for them is to basically become MIT in the eyes of uh, African students. So most of students will be completely aware that, or at least they have had that awareness that uh, EPFL is the university of the world they have to go. And basically in that sense, having that big presence in particular markets. So that could be another possible uh, choice for the institutions, but then in that sense, uh, the universities probably will have to do look at that investment at more strategic uh, level. Another possibility for universities is through unbundling of some of these courses. And even in a, a recent MOOC that we taught in partnership with edX, uh, learners really uh, come in many of these courses and complete one or two of these uh, uh, units that we had in the course. But they were not necessarily interested in the entire course. And uh, we basically see opportunity for universities in that uh, credentialing process where universities can provide credentialing at smaller units. Uh, I'm going to use the word competencies and the U.S. The many programs and institutions are uh, gain, getting acquainted with the competency-based degrees. Uh, we, of course, can move away from the notion of a simple competency as it may have just a, a simple vocational education knowledge or very kind of employability, but we can also talk about capabilities. And there are some innovative models coming out of Australia. For example, the university is offering a quite innovative approach where they have credentialing for life in their recent spin-off company called Deakin Digital. So there could, those could be many different opportunities and in these types of credentialing models then students can then potentially build that evidence about their learning through MOOCs and then turn back to their universities to credential learning that they acquired or they had successfully completed uh, through, through MOOCs and that could be another way to justify the investment. And of course finally as a researcher uh, universities can also see to what extent they were able to translate some of the innovation and lesson learned into their own campus offerings and innovate their existing practices. Thank you very much, Dragon. That's a very interesting and very comprehensive reply. Um, and thank you for your talk. I know it's difficult to give a presentation by Skype, so thank you for doing that. Uh, and I know that Edinburgh and all of us will look forward to seeing you um, face to face, perhaps at the next planned meeting. So thanks very much. Thanks very much and for a pleasure. Mm. Mm. Bye. Okay, bye for now. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. My name is uh, uh, Jeremy Knox. I'm a lecturer in, here uh, in digital education here from the University of Edinburgh. And what I want to talk to you about, hopefully in the next 20 minutes, uh, is some ideas about what I'm calling sources at the moment are more than human analytics. So if we're talking about future thinking and future human research, this talk will perhaps be at the, at the radical end of the future thinking. So um, hopefully, at least, it will be. 
So some of what I'm going to talk about comes from my PhD research, which was completed in last years, specifically on the subject of MOOCs. And what I tried to do in that work was to uh, argue for a way of looking at things, at courses like MOOCs, um, beyond just the human beings involved, beyond just the students. So what we've heard a lot about today and some of the other great and valuable <coughs> kinds of research that are going on around MOOCs is a, a focus on measuring or studying the students that are taking part and seeing students as the, the main way of getting insight about well, what, what is happening in MOOCs. So while that research needs to be done and is very valuable, I think there is a case for some of the future research that's happening in this space to try and look at MOOCs, uh, look at the wider things that are happening around MOOCs. And some of the things that I did in my PhD research was to look at the spatial qualities of MOOCs and the technologies involved. And trying to think about those things in combination with the students. So combinations of, of humans and non-human elements as useful ways of thinking about the MOOC. So it's this kind of assumption that I want to sort of challenge a little bit today in, in, the, in my ideas about future research that we do, it's not just the students we need to be concerned about when we try to understand what MOOCs are. Oops, just got one. That one. So the two things I'm going to try, to try to fit in are suggesting a couple of problems in assuming that it, it's just the students we're focusing on when we do research. And then hopefully I'll get on to suggesting some of the ways that we might approach data collection uh, specifically in a way that tries to look at this, uh, this wider context of what's happening in this globalized and digitally infused kind of education that we're seeing in the book. So both of these ideas, suggesting problems and offering uh, uh, different ideas, are underpinned by an, uh, so, so, uh, the idea that MOOCs do offer something genuinely new. Now, I know there's been a lot of uh, commentary lately which has quite rightly and quite interestingly critiqued the idea that MOOCs are new, and they've talked about the long histories of open education, the long histories of uh, technology uh, use, the fact that open education has a, has a very long history as well. And of course, those arguments aren't valid. But I think, and as I've discussed previously, when we start to think about the huge numbers of participants involved, tens of thousands of people uh, studying at the same time uh, a, a mix of cultural contexts, multiple spatial qualities to the uh, how we can think about these moves happening, where they're happening. And of course, that all underpinned by very complex technologies, complex hardware in infrastructures, and the software and algorithms that operate. When we start to think about those things together, rather than as separate entities, then I think we might have something that is um, a useful way of thinking how this is an unprecedented situation in education. <clears throat> so this is just a list of some prominent research that is come about in the MOOC space recently. And the purpose of this slide is to suggest that lots of the research that has come out has adopted these quite hard quantitative and qualitative kind of positions. So I'm going to talk about this top list in a little bit more detail shortly. So these, you might recognize some of these if, if, you're, if you've been following this research. These are the, uh, the, some of the papers that have come out of the uh, partnerships with the large uh, US-based platforms. And they've really uh, produced these studies, drawing data-driven studies, drawing on the data that's coming kind of to platforms. And what I seem to have sensed is uh, almost a reaction to that with some, uh, some other studies which have called for things like ethnography, phenomenological studies, as better ways of understanding the MOOC. And it's almost as if the argument there is, well, this research isn't human enough. If we, if we want to understand what MOOCs are, we really need to get to know what the human condition is. We need to do ethnographies. We need to understand what people are really uh, experiencing on these courses. So my argument um, is that that research, therefore, isn't oppositional. It's, it's within the same area because uh, the, the argument in all of this research is if we want to understand books, we need to focus on what is human, what is most authentically human here as, as a way of understanding what's going on. And I think that's encapsulated uh, in, in this uh, phrase from, this was a group doing research with 
Coursera courses, uh, I think in partnership with the University of Pennsylvania. So there's this idea that we cannot know them, we cannot know how revolutionary or transformative it's going to be unless we understand who these people are. And of course that was motivated, as I'm sure we all know, by the open nature of MOOCs. In, in a normal institution, the, admin, the admissions processes would pick up some of this data, so we saw this big drive for profiling students, trying to get information about the age, the gender, the nationality, the educational background of the students as a way of drilling down and to try and find out what's happening in these courses. And it almost there was a kind of second wave where uh, this idea that there's a single type of MOOC student was critiqued. I think that was a, a very a valuable um, point to bring up there. Uh, the idea that there's different groupings, the different types of people who take these courses. So we saw another strand of research uh, along the lines of, of grouping students into active or passive types of students. Things like experienced or novice uh, participants or research which looked at the different types of things they were doing within the platform to categorize the different uh, types of participants that were taking part in these courses. So once again, the idea was focusing on what students were doing as the way to try and understand what's happening here. That strategy was critiqued a little bit for its hierarchical uh, in nature and its privileging of certain modes. I think that's demonstrated quite well in this visualization from a, a group who were doing research around the edX platform. And within these different uh, roles, of course, the certified, meaning the, the student who had completed and gained the certificate, seems to be the only one that doesn't have only. So we've got a clear hierarchy here of a certain type of participant being the authentic kind of student. And of course, the very valuable critique that came up around that was that there are other ways of engaging in these courses which might be valuable. And there was very interesting discussions going on about this supposed category of the lurker. So the lurker is the uh, student who <coughs> enrolls in a MOOC but doesn't necessarily take part in the ways that might have been predefined by the course organizer. Yeah. And this is a useful diagram because it shows um, that in the majority of these studies and in the majority of these cases, the lurkers were uh, most people enrolling in these, in these MOOCs turned out to be lurkers. And there was lots of people who were uh, uh, very interestingly talking about the justification of being able to look in a MOOC as a valuable experience for the students. In my work, what I argue is that, particularly the lurker, but actually lots of these classifications of students uh, rely on more than just the student themselves. So if we look at the, the lurker specifically, one doesn't become a lurker by actually doing anything. The, the category of lurker is produced by the absence of data. So you don't do anything to become a lurker. You, you, it's by not watching a video, by not um, taking part in a quiz, by not joining a discussion forum. So in some of my other work, and in a bit more detail, I argue that the category of lurker cannot be just attributed to the student. And the problem we, uh, we come to there when we come at, when in education is that I think we have a tendency in education to work with theories to underpin our capture of data and our analysis of data. We underpin that with ideas that center on human beings, students, center on an authentic human condition is what we like to work with when we try to understand learning. Um, and of course these other, these other groupings are the same because they are in the sense that they are also derived from specific aspects of the platform technology which help those categorizations uh, become defined, the videos, the quizzes, and so on. Um, so the, the second brief example I want to give, uh, w w which makes that same point, is to do with another uh, uh, aspect of MOOC research that we've seen a lot of, and that is, is mapping and locating students. So you can't really uh, encounter MOOC promotion at all without coming across a map or some kind of globe, I and mean, it's everywhere, I and mean, we really are supposed to get from that that the MOOC is a, a, this project of, of global education. And of course that has spread <coughs> into lots of the research that has, has come up in this space. Most often in the kind of visualization that is often known as a heat map. So this, this one was produced by a group working uh, with data from Coursera, from a number of University of Pennsylvania uh, 
posted, and many of you would have seen this uh, visualization. There's another one here from a group working with edX, and there's a, they, they produced a number of these heat maps. And of course, the fantastic, uh, also some other research uh, by uh, here at Edinburgh, which have uh, put together all this data from the first uh, couple of runs of, of books. So what we are meant to get from these visualizations, I argue, is what we're supposed to understand is the location and the distribution of the students taking books. And of course what the heat map does is show uh, the, the, cut, the, the hue is more intense according to the, the high number of, of enrollees. So very clearly the United States has the highest number of enrollees on, on these particular courses. Once again, my argument is that we need to think uh, in, in a wider way about uh, what's happening in these MOOCs in order to generate this kind of, this kind of <coughs> data. And we can't just default back to uh, considering students as the main focus of how we understand what might be happening here in these spaces. This is another interesting uh, map because the, 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 the world isn't already there. It's produced by the data. <coughs> so there's, there are nodes of, uh, that are clustered and sized according to where individuals have enrolled in this particular course. This is from another group who are working with, uh, the, in association with the edX platform. And these nodes are also colored according to nation state. So the, the world seems to emerge here from the enrollment data rather than maybe any uh, background to that. But what I argue is there would be a mistake just to focus our concerns. When we come to analyze this data, when we come to make sense of it, and we come to decide on what pedagogical interventions we might then make, it would be a mistake to just think about this kind of research as surfacing something purely human. And that might sound like a very obvious thing to say, but I think it is, it's something that's worth saying. The majority of those maps are produced with IP data. Uh, now, IP data is normally associated with a different uh, set of data, which decides the location. And quite often that's not done by the same group, and it's not done with the same uh, set of data. So what we're looking at here is uh, a third party organization called MaxMind. At least one of the um, Stanford uh, group of researchers that I think I mentioned earlier cite uh, using the MaxMind database. So there, this is a, a third party organization which associates location data with IP data. And what we're looking at here is a publicly available table of uh, the, the rightmost percentage value there, if you, can, if you can see those numbers, is accuracy. And it's accuracy of their, their ability to associate IP with specific location. So we might, for example, pick on, two, pick, pick on an example of the United States at 84% accuracy, and in the Southern American continent we have Venezuela there at 31% accuracy. I don't want to get too much into the details of how this kind of data is generated. My point is pretty simple, that there are wider contexts happening here when we think about how the data is generated. We might, for example, infer very different hardware infrastructure in those regions as things contributing to a vastly different 84% to 31%. We also might think about socioeconomic conditions within those regional areas, regional uh, contexts that are affecting not only how the data is produced in the, in the maps we're looking at, but also we might think about how one accesses this education, one accesses the MOOC. So this isn't a world of universal access in terms of infrastructure, it's a world of regional context. So it's those sorts of things that I think we need to um, be wary of when we think about what the, the data is, is generating. These are another couple of examples from some of the other reports that I've already cited, and they just show the difficulty in, of being able to locate IP accurately, and also some of the other um, workarounds that some of these teams did to do that. So my point isn't really that um, the, the problem is that it isn't accurate, accurate enough. My point is that it, the fact that it isn't accurate points to, the, to lots of other contexts that we need to be aware of when we're measuring what's happening in these moves. 
And of course, uh, the other thing we need to be wary of when we look at these maps and these visions of the globe uh, are other ways of interpreting what's happening here. And I'll try and touch on this briefly in my very last slide. And I'm glad that uh, Jeff mentioned these ideas about uh, colonialism in relation to the book earlier. So my point here is this is not, we might think of this not just as uh, a particular kind of education being uh, sold to the rest of the world. We might think about a new territory of personal data as, as something that's happening here when the data is collected and analyzed. And that's something I think Ben Williamson, in terms of visual, in visualizations, has been uh, very sharp with. And that's something I think we should bear in mind when we're thinking about um, analytics. So just to briefly sum up my two examples, lurking and location. My underlying uh, the point I want to stress here is that in neither of those examples of research can we really pin down those points of data to something that we we can say is exclusively human about that data. I want to suggest to you, or to argue, that those data points are produced by a number of things. Yes, they are produced by the behavior of the human beings and the students and their location, but they're also produced by vastly complex technologies that are coming together to make those data points, and also the methods of research that go about doing that. So, when it comes to education, my point is, when we have this data, we cannot necessarily ground it in theory which are looking for an authentic human being as the way that we go about making sense of that data. I think there's bigger thinking we can do there. And one of the ways I think we can approach this is not just to acknowledge the more than human or the non-human in MOOCs, but to actively encourage it and to actively give it a voice. So my, my uh, idea for the future of MOOC research is to engage with the area of the Internet of Things. So this is an idea, this is a, an area of technology that some, some of you will be um, quite familiar with. It's the idea that we can use sensor technology to allow the real things in the world to generate data. So some of the claims that are, are, are made are things like buildings, objects, <coughs> doors, tables, the things that we interact with in our physical spaces can produce data about their condition and that data can be sent to the web or it can be used in research. <coughs> this is just a quote from an email that I received <coughs> about a, uh, a call for papers just the other day and it's, it's there Firstly, to show, to try and demonstrate that this is a burgeoning and interesting area, but also I think to signal uh, the need for critique here and the need for scholarship around some of the claims. We can be critical also about the claims of revolution and disruption in the MOOCs, and that we, I think we need to take that same uh, sensibility to thinking about the Internet of Things. So, um, just with one eye on the time, um, of course, if we have a smartphone, then we're already carrying around some very sophisticated uh, sensor hardware. So I'm hoping most people know what I'm talking about when I say something like a sensor. The, the, the one that most people will know on your smartphone is a GPS sensor, which will give you, you location data. This sort of thing is becoming uh, very much more in the mainstream. This is an example of a very uh, mainstream kind of non-technical product, something that doesn't really require any technical skills to use. It's called a twine, and it's a sensor that uh, will connect to the internet with Wi-Fi, and it will sense things like temperature, it will sense its orientation, and it will sense vibration. So I actually had this tied to my front door when I went on holiday over Christmas, and it would send me an email <coughs> if it vibrated, thereby telling me that somebody had opened my front door. So these things can pass data about the real world conditions to, to the web. So that might seem... Um, uh, Fun. How do we relate this to MOOCs? Well, one example uh, is a prototype that I developed uh, last year. And oh, I'm on this one. And my thinking around this was, well, what's the most obvious um, educational object? And of course, the, the one that immediately came to mind was a book. And I wanted to think about how we might get data about the use of this educational object onto the web and doing things. So this uh, example is a prototype. It's certainly not something that's at the commercial end of 
sensors. It's uh, very much hacked together by me, but it uses RFID uh, technology, which is an a RFID tag and a sensor. Some of you may be familiar with this, this kind of sensor. So um, what it's really designed to do uh, superficially is allow this book to send a tweet. So there's an RFID tag on the back of this book, and there's an RFID uh, sensor on, the, on my book stand here. So very simply, if I were to um, go ahead and place my book on the book stand and read, the sensor will activate. Not a very good book stand. <laughs> but, um, the sensor will activate, and if you look at the future and hashtag, in a few seconds you should see um, the, the MOOC space account tweet a random sentence from this book. So superficially, we might say, in a sort of playful way, that this book, as an object, is contributing in some way to this learning space, if it, if it was that. So that might be quite a playful idea, but I think what it does signal are some interesting ways we can start to think about tangible, real things being involved in the study of MOOCs. So I see this as a, a, a way of starting to get us to think about uh, not online education as virtual, but this kind of education is happening with real things in real spaces. And that sort of leads me on to my other example, which is an idea about a visualization. And this was uh, done very simply with the GPS center on my mobile phone. This image uh, doesn't appear very well, but it's Edinburgh. And it shows the positions I was in when I was doing my participant observation of the MOOC. It showed my journeys around the city when I was doing different studies. And it shows roughly, although the data isn't precisely accurate on this bit, it shows roughly where the different technologies of study, the Coursera platform, Twitter, and so on, were being used in the, in the different locations. So while this is, uh, this is a, obviously a very small scale uh, idea, um, what I think it starts to, to get us thinking about is the combination of online and offline space in MOOCs and ways to bring data from both those spaces together and ways for us to consider MOOCs on those terms. Now I think actually this uh, disrupting of the online and offline boundary goes way beyond MOOCs. And if, I, if we're going to future think, <coughs> I think the majority of, of educational provision in the future is going to be combinations of online and sophisticated campus-based combinations. So thinking about how we can generate data from the online and the offline together is a, a fruitful way for any institutions or groups to pursue that I think are beyond just the future of MOOCs. So uh, I suppose a few cautions here when uh, thinking about this. Just to sum up, my point really is that analytics can, we can move into this space usefully uh, to think about surfacing some of the com complexities that are happening in this massiveness, this space. And I should have said uh, earlier that um, massiveness is a term that really I use in need, of a, in need of a different term. So any suggestions to, uh, to something else than massiveness would be greatly appreciated. But something that can give voice to the, to the more than human complexities that are happening um, in, these, in these courses. Signi the significant point I want to make here is that we need new theoretical resources to, uh, to deal with this, this, these kinds of perspectives on education. I'm not sure we can default to uh, ideas about uh, self-directed autonomous learners here. I think we need to focus on the bigger picture. It's not just big data we need, I think it's big thinking when it comes to education. And we need to start moving beyond ideas of uh, self-direction and autonomy in our students. Um, we also need to, as I said earlier, be uh, cautious about um, assuming that things like sensors give us accurate, real-world, uh, unproblematic access to objects in the real world. We need to maintain our critical lens there. And of course, uh, a final and very important point is when we're thinking about the non-human, this, this doesn't mean that we forego our human values. We start to talk about things that are more than human. And of course, we need to lots of the things I've shown you might involve personal data. So we can still be um, responsible in our data collection and analysis while maintaining uh, ideas about um, 
what might be more than you. I'll probably end it. Thank you very much. <coughs>
while the great woman is doing something more important than she comes to talk to you, I must utter her ideas. Um, this uh, talk is probably going to turn out to be a footnote to Dragon's last two slides. Um, and it's about um, uh, looking, uh, thinking a bit more about the importance of peer interaction in MOOCs. Now, actually, the, the relationship of Sarah and me in this talk is, uh, is about to emerge. A few months ago, Sarah participated in this particular MOOC um, on rhizomatic learning. When I asked her about it afterwards, she said that was the best learning experience she's ever had. Now, she said it was about 50 now. So, clearly, one way of doing research in this area is to pay attention to outstanding um, course design and see if we can understand a bit better. The um, important part of uh, it being good for her is the intensely social nature of, of this particular <coughs> However, from a point of view of how do we research this, one of the things that immediately struck me as I tried to question Sarah about um, what had gone on was the way um, the active members of the MOOC had spontaneously wandered from technology to technology. And in fact, none of the ones that were important were provided by the MOOC provider. Um, but it wasn't that like one of them had an idea and forced the others to use it. I think the important thing is it seemed natural to them in these conversations to migrate almost daily between platforms depending on the type of discussion. And, and that, I think, must have lessons that aren't usually quite articulated about why these different platforms support different aspects of interaction differently from each other. Um, so those are some of the things that were done and the point here is that none of these are part of the official platform, and this usage was emergent behavior. So in other words, doing analytics just on the main platform is probably going to miss most of the social interaction. And if, like me, you think that social interaction is one of the most educational parts of at least some MOOCs, then one can even argue that naive analytics are going to miss the entire show. Now, just a, a few points, just a, you know, a few preliminary points about the differences in these platforms. So, Twitter obviously is short, it's also public. Um, uh, blogs are, are longer, more considered, but also public. But also, blogs are asymmetric. So, a naive uh, liberal idea about discussion is everyone's equal, you sit around a table, everyone has the same amount of control over the topic. What's interesting about a blog is that for the moment, for the time that the blog is the centre of the um, group's um, interaction, is that one learner is in the centre and the others are focusing on that learner's work. So that's a di so one of the things this brings out is the, the role and the differential benefits shift with the technology. So there are moments when that's useful. Now there's Facebook group with a bit more attention to privacy, um, Google Docs too. So there's not only this migration across platforms, but also it comes with different properties. Now, Sarah did this slide and didn't explain to me exactly what she meant, but if I remember her commentary, um, she thought a quite typical thing would be they'd be chatting together in the Facebook group, um, and then at least one of them gets fired up enough to want to write a more considered piece. And that might move up to Google Docs or onto the blog. <coughs> Here she's making a joke. You get really excited. You write a paper together. You send it into a conference. It gets rejected. Back to the other. And so on. So um, what's been focused on here then is this migration. Um, now, one aspect of this is about privacy. Now, we're all kind of aware that there's... Um, privacy difficulties, but what I'm trying to bring out here is that there's no one right privacy session. So it's no good thinking like a warrior bureaucrat in a university will hide everything because then we can't be criticised. Um, and what's it? Because it too changes. Because just think of any kind of education. There's a, probably a, quite common is <coughs> learners don't really mind if they're being snooped on right at the beginning of a course. They know nothing. They have nothing to hide. And in the middle, when they got to the point of being wrong and they want a sympathetic and therefore probably closed audience, it gives them the freedom to discuss, they'll want privacy. But at the end of the best courses, you 
they'll be producing bits of work they'd like to show to their employers. In fact, they'd actually like it even better if the course automatically publicised it to the world. So it's not that either public or private is right. It's that it's probably true within a characteristic educational trajectory, the amount of privacy <coughs> needs to vary. And this, I think, has not has been noticed, but not commented on loudly enough. So what to do about privacy setting is not known at the time the software is designed. And of course, privacy models tend to be tied to a piece of software. In fact, when an individual types your first words, you often don't know what the audience is. It's when you see what you've written, you decide. Uh, in fact, we saw an example today where um, Jeff, uh, whether playfully or not, sent somebody to say because of the bad privacy settings of having this stream. And he may or may not have been joking in particular, but I think that's a typical, uh, typical issue. You, it's actually an ongoing <coughs> deciding the privacy session, and indeed the audience. So in other words, the author's choice of audience often changes during the process of creation. Um, I've talked about that, but the point is, the chain, it's not only that there's not one right privacy session, the direction of privacy change isn't even unidirectional, and that actually defeats all the... Uh, everything that's so far available on the web. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't mean it's not a wish list just because we haven't got the solution to it. Though. So how are we managing this? Not very well, because apps are typically developed with one type of audience in mind. And I think that's a, a lot to do with the, the migration that Sarah uh, noticed as a spontaneous thing that uh, is part of that migration is about privacy. Still, there are other ways of classifying different types of interaction. So, um, the idea behind this talk began, I think, from that coming out of Sarah's personal experience that um, a lot of platforms were used, that that was spontaneous, and they seemed to have different properties, which participants had kind of intuitively knew about and adapted to. But there's several other just as important angles on how one might begin to classify the kind of peer interaction. So one is about the role. So um, a lot of people tend to think, if pushed, that collaboration is about joint product. And in a workplace, as opposed to in a learning context, that's probably the most common <coughs> time. Now, the thing about collaborating about a joint product is the natural thing is you specialize the labor. If I have to write a paper, I uh, love having someone who is good at completing it who will correct my spelling and will get it off on time because those are things I'm not good about. Uh, I can hope to add some inspiration and some other things. But of course, if you specialise labour, one of the things that goes with efficient division of labour is you don't bother to explain to the other person why you're doing stuff. If they trust you enough, um, uh, you each do your own aspect and you don't learn very much from the other about it. Now, quite different from that is the kind of discussion that Naomi Miyake called constructive interaction, that Christine Howe did all those experiments on, which is about conversations where conceptual development happens. And they have the opposite properties. You do explain all the time, but you're not obliged to accept the other person's explanation. Often what they say triggers the development in your thought rather than delivers it. And as been shown in some studies in great detail, different to the part of the contributors to such a conversation take away different things. But they both benefit. So um, there's generally benefits for both, but the particular benefit to individuals is different. So for instance, one of the things Christine Howe showed was if you get two children at different stages of conceptual development to discuss, both of them advance. Now, on a naive, non-constructivist information transmission model of learning, that should be impossible. The most you can do is to drag up the the numpty up to the level of the other one. But in fact, in the process of trying to explain, the one who started off ahead moves further ahead because, as you know, there's nothing like trying to teach something. It's the single most powerful learning activity you can engage in, um, and so on and so forth. So the point is, these are not identical benefits. They're, in some sense, complementary. And that's just as true of sort of peer review, too. Now, confident. Learners move fluently and fluently between these. That is, it's natural 
in your own behavior as a learner, um, at least by this time in your uh, learning lives, to naturally do all of those things together. And you don't imagine that doing one means you don't need the other kind of interaction. Now, another way of uh, trying to classify interaction would be by content. So some of this will be ultra familiar to you. Um, so the kind of discussion I'd like to see students doing is, of course, and they may argue, kind of talk about concepts. Very rare in most forums, but it does exist. Far more common is they're sharing what I crudely call admin information, like when's the exam, what do they really mean, have I understood what's been asked of us. So it's about the course, but it's, it's about learning, it's not about content. There's um, questions that are seeking reassurance, but another way of looking at that, I think, perhaps more interestingly, certainly in the light of some of the other points this afternoon, is students use social comparison to calibrate their own self-regulation. So if everyone hasn't understood it, then I'm not stupid and I don't need to change <coughs> more effort. If I'm the only one who hasn't understood it, that indicates both that it's possible and that it's highly desirable. And they have to do that because teachers are completely hopeless at giving realistic, truthful information to students about what they need to do. Students have to um, try and get information out of others to, as a benchmark for their self-regulation. There's bits of, that's Sarah's phrase, making social bonding. I couldn't possibly comment on how she does that social bonding, but you <laughs> um, This point, <clears throat> I used to have a more optimistic view of human nature, but uh, lately I've come around to the view that uh, whinging is a human need. Uh, and that's really because the very best teachers I've ever known, uh, when you get them relaxed enough, will complain about students. So if even the best uh, need to whinge, I think there's just something in us that uh, needs to do some of that, and probably every day. So you can certainly see that in student discussions. And the other thing is I think it's important to realize that uh, not all our vocalization is about rational communication. But when we shout at the office hall with no one there, it seems to be saying that quite a, at least some of what we say is just not actually intended for any audience. It's somehow um, just a need. So it would be a mistake to analyze all communications between students as necessarily about information transmission that it has some rational opinion. So, in other words, if you're trying to analyze forums, if you're wondering about what to provide, um, you might see all of these kinds of interaction, or at least communication, um, varied by content type. Now, the last lens I'm just going to mention is what I think of as a neo Vygotsky perspective. I'll just say why this has gradually sunk completely into my mind. Vygotsky's view, now there's no reason why Vygotsky's account of how actual humans in Russia 80 years ago um, has to be a general model of adult learning. But here's why I think it actually is an interesting lens to uh, exercise regularly. A few years ago I heard a talk by Paul Black which really spiked me with this. He said that one of the teacher, school teachers he collaborated with would spend really a lot of class time in basic science not doing anything in any way connected to the science curriculum. It was about having class discussions about uh, simple um, questions related to science like, I don't know, why does wood float or something like that, and having the students discuss. Why, and he, he said why he did that was because many of these kids, he said, will never have heard a conversation which was resolved on the basis of giving reasons, as opposed to shouting or fighting or authority or something like that. Mm -hmm. And if you have an experience of that style of conversation, what sense could science possibly have? Now, that, as I say, that got right through to me. It made me think we should think. It made me think that my first degree in physics, which I actually absolutely adored, was in some sense a complete educational failure. But it made me a huge fan of physics results. It never made me ever go to resolve a question by empirical measurement. That only came later in my career. 
Um, so, if we can think of science as a whole as a specific style of conversation, can we think of actually much smaller lumps of education like that? Well, I think there's some mileage in it. So, for instance, if I try and say what is the real learning aim that an academic typically has, and you don't listen to what people say, but to what you think they really mean, I think most of them would be true that they'd like to turn out undergraduates that somehow think like them. So what would that mean in the psychology department? It means aiming to turn out uh, undergraduates who would react to research papers published next year in the same way that the staff would. So that means being able to read that language, it means having the same values for making critical judgments. It's not about learning conclusions or learning facts. It's about a style of conversation. So to be crude about it, we're turning out undergraduates to write psychology essays, whereas the history history department is turning them out to write history essays. Very different kind of essay. But if we interpret essay as something like a conversation, I think you're saying something deep about learning aims when you're thinking about it as a mode of conversation into which you're trying to induct people, usually over a long period of time. Now, so this lens, looking at peer discussion in MOOCs, would be, <coughs> can we approve or not a given course design as uh, seeming to support that conversational process uh, in which um, Beginners can barely say goodbye and hello, but in the end they can hold their own uh, with an equally um, valid conversation with staff and then move on to think like that inside their head without a conversational partner. Now, could that happen in MOOCs? Well, it's not quite impossible because a lot of MOOCs seem to have a big expertise range among their learners. And if you've got that um, variegated expertise gradient, then there's the human potential there to provide this sort of endless conversational practice, partly with people who are no more than you, and will um, get you to be able to practice the, that style of conversation better. So the design question then would be, is this MOOC supporting that? Is it supporting not trivial social conversations or factual exchange, but actually in some sense conversation at the disciplinary level? So in summary, um, I've offered three, or maybe they are, I hit two under two, three or four um, different ways of classifying peer interaction. So the challenge for research then would be how you um, uh, collect data that's relevant to styles of peer interaction and the, and the variegated styles there are, beginning with the challenge which Dragan mentioned about crossing software platforms in order to actually catch the whole conversation instead of just a little bit the MOOC machine supported directly. Right, so that's the end. I can tweet Sarah to say what a good job I did. <laughs> Thank you. So, we've got time for some questions. <coughs> Can a lovely talk. Is it, I mean, is there a reason for backing off the notion of, well, let's just forget about privacy altogether? And a, and a way and re, and to say to learners, okay, you're using technology, that's not private, that's the way it is. Um, because it makes some things much simpler if you, if you don't fret. I do. But I think uh, Sarah had a particular anecdote which, uh, about this, out of this, when we were discussing this talk. And I may not get this right, but it was about how they, part of this um, particular MOOC, they'd written an auto-ethnography each and had forgotten to change the privacy settings on Google Docs. And then someone else um, came across these, uh, took out a quote out of context and presented it in their own talk to another conference. And they all felt outraged, although they couldn't quite articulate why they were outraged. So I think, um, I think it's the learners who have senses in some context, but not others, about the privacy. And this is to do with ownership rather than embarrassment? I think so. Um, it's hard to be sure, but 
the way I think about annoying and embarrassing conversations in social life is that there's a brand of, there's a brand of social psychologists who you know, tries to see all human behaviour as producing justifications to other people. And it's work to do that. Mm -hmm. But it's much easier with people you know and trust mm -hmm. because you have to say less <coughs> and they understand it better. So I think even if you had no absolute <coughs> social shame, there's still the question about, and you see this in the media when someone gets challenged on out of context thing, it's, they might believe what they say, but it's just so much work to, and especially after the accusation, it's so much work to produce a justification. So you might feel justified inside and you don't want to do the social work to defend it. Um, and so one of the questions in my week of my MOOC, I actually asked people about their information behavior, what kinds of information they um, interacted with or kept bumped into in the process of doing the play MOOC. Um, and certainly human beings, interacting with human beings was something that a lot of them mentioned for finding out about the MOOC in the first place. But also they mentioned discussion with sort of friends and family that was obviously uh, it wasn't interaction with peers within the MOOC, but it sounded like some um, people outside the MOOC were more or less becoming peers because they were, um, uh, I, not many of them went into detail because it was just in the comments thing. <coughs> the, the spread of the MOOC was actually outside the, um, the virtual MOOC. Um, so I just wanted to flag that up if you No, if you yes, I would. I think actually all this applies to. Uh, conventional courses as well. So, for instance, in the last few years I got very interested about the role of discussion. Is it really essential? And is it irreplaceable in learning? And I tentatively think yes, but in the course of that, I did a few informal interviews, and here's one that took me back and made me realise the staff actually had no idea about whether there's student discussion on the course. And this was the sort of student who asked her if she discussed with other students, and she said, oh no. But then she let slip that a couple of days before an essay deadline, she'd phone up her mum. <coughs> and I don't think her mum was an academic, so you know how that conversation went. It was pretty one way, but somehow necessary to the learning process. Can I ask you a question about <coughs> enculturation? So if you come to how a... How do you spell it? I don't know. Yes. Go on. We'll, we'll bypass that. So if you come to a traditional university, you've got a long period of enculturation. You've got you know, everything from applying through UCAS and then the, uh, the pre-university um, session and the uh, meeting other students <coughs> coming in through the portal of the university. When you go into a MOOC, you're thrown straight in there. Um, you, know, you can get in in a, you know, less than a minute. And then you're into what's being modelled as an academic environment that many we hope many of the people don't come from a traditional UK academic background. How do you manage that process of enculturation? Do you make it a lot more explicit that this is an academic environment and you're expected to behave in this way and these are academic discussions? Or do you model it implicitly? Um, and if so, how? Well, uh, possibly we should just stop feeling dismayed about how many MOOC participants already have degrees and um, emphasise the idea that uh, even for those being thrown in, they're going to be surrounded by those who are on the culture and therefore provided <coughs> they're in current, you know, suitably mixed up with the others, it will happen like that. Um, the second thing I might say is, this is not a, a well-honed thought, but uh, in trying to think about what the one or ten most valuable things a graduate learns, what's the real graduate attributes, I think one interesting uh, possibility is maybe university is typically the place where, contrary to all our domestic and social instincts, we get to grips with the idea that you can interact with other people who you don't know and don't like particularly and be productive from both your points of view because professional life not just in university, I mean, even if you're in a shop, it's all about interacting with strangers in a way that's personal, but doesn't depend on whether you, th you, know, you trust the further you can throw them. And I think that's 
particularly true of learning ideas, because you can learn, you don't like it so much, but you can learn just as much from someone you hate as you do from someone you really like. It's not as pleasurable, but it's just as useful. So that idea that there can be reciprocal benefit without those normal social checks, I think, is a deep lesson, and it isn't what you come out of the home expecting. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I wouldn't expect you to be able to have a 30 second or 30 minute introduction and a movie and get that in one. But thirdly, I think when you say enculturation, I'd agree. I think uh, um, that is if I interpret it as another Vygotskyan process. So here's one actual example, another reason I'm kind of keen on the Vygotskyan perspective is I do some reciprocal peer critiquing myself in my own practice with a, a, a tutorial, regular tutorial group of about six. And when I read the literature on doing it via software, a lot of that literature says how bad the quality of the reviews is, they're abusive, hostile, and that's partly because the reviews are anonymous. Now for me, uh, well it didn't occur to me, first of all I didn't give them a choice about doing it, secondly I said you go away and read this stuff, produce the kinds, and then you sit in front of me and we'll go around the table and you deliver them. Now, delivering something face to face, when they're about to deliver something to you face to face, it's self-regulating in a whole different way than that anonymity is. But I think also, having me present the first time, although well, I didn't realise I was being a policeman, I think that made that first session go at the appropriate level. Uh, and after that, they didn't leave me that. They volunteered to do this stuff without my supervision elsewhere. So I think that modelling is going to be very powerful and quite cheap, in fact. Yeah. There were some deliberate decisions made in designing the FutureLearn platform. One of them was that nobody should be anonymous. That people should use their real names and their real identities um, for some of those reasons. That was not only entertaining but also thought-provoking. Thank you very much, Steve. Can I just, she's just tweeted to say she's watching you. Oh. <laughs> and I'll now hand over to Eileen. Um, so just going to stand to up for about five seconds to introduce Mike. Um, so our, last <laughs> <laughs> our, last social <laughs> our last talk of the day, Mike's going to talk to us about future possibilities for research and future learn. And then we'll take whatever time is left both to ask him questions and not get into the um, organisational things we might want to do on with the network. We've got a couple of. Um, uh, plans in place for the next uh, the meetings which we can share with us and get your reactions to it. Would you like? Thank you, Ivy. So, as most of you know, I wear two hats. Um, so part of my time is at BOU in IET. Part of my time, I'm seconded to FutureLearn. Um, usually, at these sessions, I'm wearing my OU hat. Just for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to wear my FutureLearn hat, which is why it's a FutureLearn branded talk. Um, and the reason for this is that FutureLearn is increasingly keen on um, how to keep universities engaged, but not just engaged, but how to extend the number of courses and the number of reruns of courses. And there are a number of ways FutureLearn is looking at this. One of them is around the research benefits. So Russell Beale and I have put together a presentation that we're doing a kind of roadshow around partners. We're not going to go to all of them. And this is a very, very compressed version of that, which I'd be interested to get your comments on. So what are the research benefits of engaging with future learning? Um, and here are some of them, research into MOOCs, research with MOOCs, future learning courses to communicate research findings and MOOCs for public engagement. And I'm going to whip through these very quickly and then ask for your comments on them. So research into MOOCs is pretty much what today has been about, um, and just about all of these um, areas have been covered by the presentations today, such as discourse analysis, pedagogy of MOOCs, analytics. Um, <coughs> and, I mean, it's again worth restating that there have been some explicit pedagogy put into the Future Learn platform, which we've encapsulated in the phrase social learning, but there are a number of different elements that we have tried to bake into the platform. So there's research um, through and into FutureLearn as a massive social learning platform. 
And there's research into innovative content and learning. I mentioned uh, the Hadrian's Wall course, um, and there was an exercise step in that where originally the intention was essentially that there was going to be a large image with an overlay and working with David Major and the course team uh, then developed overlays on Google Maps that could do things like show magnetometry data. So there's opportunity to research ways of engaging learners and presenting information to learners. And as we've seen, there's um, research in analytics, particularly analytics for action. Um, and we can look at it in three broad ways. Um, uh, one in transactions, so who did what, um, when they did it, on what device, and there are uh, Google Analytics that we're using for that. There's research and uh, analytics for interactions, how did people interact with the learning design, and there's uh, analytics around conversations and the social aspects, so what do they talk about, who are they connected to. Um, all of those uh, can be supported through um, the data that you get back from the courses and um, the opportunities, particularly through FLAM, to do comparative analytic studies as well. And I'm really pleased that there's uh, the first papers that are coming through doing comparative uh, analytics now across future learning courses. And then there's research with MOOCs, which is to use the platform for inquiry into society or culture, to provoke an audience and analyze responses, to do polling, reviewing, and to access large data from diverse samples. So there's 24% uh, in general of <coughs> learning courses that are non uh, have to <coughs> university, 8% uh, who are looking for work, 9% um, who are 66 years and over. So if you've got a MOOC of you know, 10,000 or 15,000 people. That's a large a number of people um, in those interesting categories. Um, examples, falls and cyber security, two courses that have been collecting online data through the course. And it's been entirely open, so that they've asked the participants on the course to contribute their data, and then they've shown back um, the results of that data collection to the learners themselves. So it's been an open process, but it's also been valuable um, to the researchers who are looking at these issues such as falls and cybersecurity, particularly um, people's uh, responses and their own um, experiences. So in the Mind is Flat, for example, they conducted online experiments through the course into um, people's uh, perceptions of um, estimation. So how good people were estimating uh, and also what their perceptions were of how good they were at, at estimating. So asking people to um, estimate, what's this one, how long is the River Thames? Uh, and then you had to estimate what you thought was the minimum, maximum length and then what your confidence was in making that estimation. They presented their data back to the learners during the course um, both uh, in aggregate and also in, in specific responses. That was done off the platform. So again, it's worth saying that a number of these things can be linked from the platform um, onto a, a research environment where you conduct that and then you take the data as um, course designers back onto the platform to pre present it to the learners. And so that's um, research with um, the, um, the, the MOOCs. Another one is around using future learn courses to communicate research. So a future learn course can be a contribution to ref impact. Um, it's a citable um, object with a permanent URL and as we're developing also um, um, the ability to share elements of a, a future learn course, there will be URLs associated with each element. Um, with, with each step of the course. So each of those are permanent and can be citable. So for example, um, you can then, uh, from the Ref Impact aspect, you could include um, design of a future learn course and delivery of a future learn course um, in um, a Research Council Horizon 2020 bid. Um, you can communicate your research outputs also to a massive audience and build as a young researcher, a starting researcher, a research profile. Um, on the REF aspect, that's um, taken from the REF 2014 document, um, 
for the purposes of the breath, impact is defined as an effect on change or benefit to the economy, society or culture, public policy or services beyond academia. So um, the definition of impact is that it should be beyond academia. And that document also says, reach and significance regardless of the geographic location. So having international reach is good um, because it extends the impact um, regardless of geographic location. Um, I mentioned about um, building um, MOOC uh, development into research bids. There's a good example of that now, um, a recent bid that was funded by AHRC to the Open University includes £30,000 to develop a future learn course. Um, so it, um, we know that there's at least one exemplar now of a research council being willing to fund production of a future learn course at the level of £30,000 as a demonstrator of impact. So I'm hoping that when you put in future um, ESRC, EPSRC, Horizon 2020 bid, you will bake in um, an impact uh, element of production of a future learn course. And it moves for public engagement, so an opportunity to communicate a research area, to meet the university ambitions for outreach, public engagement re with research, and um, business engagement, so um, engagement with partners and sponsors. An example of that is the Open University's Ecosystems course. The Open University, as you know, has a, a very strong public engagement and outreach mission. Um, the Ecosystems course uh, linked into iSpot, which is an existing Open University platform, um, for um, public engagement in wildlife observation. And so people on the course were encouraged to go to iSpot um, to make observations of wildlife, which were then validated and commented on by other learners. And um, that was, a, again, linked to from the course, so it was a separate piece of software, but um, the educators then used that um, engagement with iSpot um, to then reflect on that back in the course. And it also had the added benefit of providing extra um, people uh, registering with the iSpot, with the iSpot platform, and building uh, reputation, building engagement with the iSpot platform. So I think there are some creative ways that you can um, use future learn courses alongside other platforms that you might have for public engagement. And so I just want to finish with two more things because these are two things that are bothering future learn at the moment. One is exams and the other is repeat <coughs> learns. So central to the future learns business model is that um, the company should be gaining revenue from exams. Now the problem is that, as you know, this isn't uh, a great incentive for universities. It is um, <coughs> partly because the revenue back from exams is not great for the universities, and there's quite a lot of effort in setting the exams and marking the exams. So is there a creative way that everybody can gain from exams? And I want to suggest one possibility is courses <coughs> linked to master's modules, where the materials are reused for campus <coughs> teaching, as well as um, for uh, open access. So you have essentially a master's module run on the FutureLearn platform with open participation, and you have an exam question bank, which is used both for the FutureLearn course, but also for um, the campus students. Uh, and then it can be part of the campus assessment as well as the open assessment. Um, then there's a purpose for uh, creating the question bank and for running the online assessment. It doesn't need to be the whole of the assessment for that master's module, but it could be part of it then you're reusing the assessment as well as reusing the, the course material. So I want you know, to think about ways in which um, exams and assessment, um, the, the exam component of future learning courses can really bring back benefits to the university. So that's one question. Are there creative ways that both the universities can gain and also future learning can gain through setting exams? The other one is repeat runs. As you know, future learning is very keen that courses should be um, rerun a number of times a year. Um, so, again, is there a research benefit of this? Um, and there's the opportunity to research learning design and to get assistance from the FutureLearn team on that.
for example, to do A and B testing of innovation. So, you know, is there a different way of teaching? Can we have a more storytelling approach to a course um, compared with a more conventional presentation with a previous course? Or more specific, you know, ordering of steps in courses. Are there particular design experiments that we could do on reruns of courses that would bring research benefit as well as um, uh, enabling um, more runs per year of courses? So those are two questions. Are there ways that exams can be of value to universities? Uh, and are there ways in which repeat runs of courses can bring re research <coughs> benefits? So, question. So there's no need to clap because that's a, these are questions for you. <laughs> a comment and a question. I mean, I mean clearly there's a lot of benefit to the, the way um, the ref handle impact and the way um, there's such a commitment to public understanding. Our own version, we have our own version of your story uh, with um, a MOOC we, we bid for a six million pound project on implants for cancer, which was a joint EPSRC. MRC and, and the colleagues who were doing that added the movement, the development of the movement, added real cost to it, and that seemed to be one of the things that clinched it. So actually asking for a bit more money and say, and we do public understanding of cancer and how tumors grow. Um, so, that's, so, that, so that seems to me a very good line. I mean, I think on the exam side, I mean, I mean, exams are, I mean, exams are are a big research agenda. My own <coughs> feeling is that lots and lots of university examinations are not fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, their deficiencies become more apparent uh, when, we, when we move into formats like this. Um, and I would have thought there was a prior question too, wouldn't it be nice for future learners they could get some income from us from their exams? And the prior question is, wouldn't it be nice if we could Produce exams that are more fit for purpose and that are more helpful for to learners in the long term. I, you know, if you, for me, if I made a shopping list of where research questions are, then the big hard one right at the very top is fit for purpose assessment. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, when a course are fin is finished, it's a lot of information in it, data, big data, that you can. And my question is. When you take this data out of the course and want to analyze it and use it, is the data as accessible in an easy way so it's very easy to take put information out and get some idea of how I could make my course better or things like that? Or is that a very heavy way to, 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 to really do some findings? in all the information that is, is there. I won't answer that because there's two people who can answer it much better than me, which are Nigel and Rebecca. So, so I, I, I think, so I'm Nigel from the future. Learn. Um, so I would say I'd like to think that the data that we make available um, is very use, easy to use, but I think it would be useful actually to hear from those who use the data to uh, answer that question. <laughs> so, if you go to your Future Learn Educator dashboard, you can download from that a series of um, CSV files, so to speak, <coughs> separated by commas, that you can put into standard software like Excel or R, if you can use R, other sorts of things. And then you can look at uh, comments which people have. Uh, put up, you can look at their step activity, you can look at how they've answered questions. Each learner has a unique ID, so you can follow the same learner and you can see what they've been doing. You can focus in on steps, you can focus in on discussion questions. So there's a lot of data there. It's sizable if you've got a big MOOC, so you might struggle to manipulate it in Excel. Um, but you can do fairly straightforward things with it in Excel, or if you're good at doing R, you can do lots of complicated things with it. And there are things up on the Future Learn Academic Network um, Facebook page where people have begun sharing how they've analysed this, where they've done more complicated things around 
sentiment analysis, for example. So the basic data is available to you in quite a straightforward fashion if you can get to the dashboard, you don't have to get to the dashboard. And there is an R script which does a standard analysis of each course, correct me if I'm wrong, which then is sent back to each partner um, and they can request, they can run that at any time, is that right or is it, it's provided it's by... Provi it's provided at the end of the course. Provided at the end of the course, but the code is now available yeah. to the partners so that you can either run it at any time on the data that you have from the dashboard or you can modify the code yourself if you're an R expert um, to tweak it or to present it in a different way. So it provides a fairly comprehensive top level analysis of your course and then you can then go down further by altering the R code or by using Excel um, to look in the data in more detail. So I think compared with some of the other platforms we've actually got a pretty good system at the moment for analysing course data but there's still a lot more that could be done. Just a uh Following up, Christian, are you planning to make more finished reports? That so that you don't, so that there are coming more. I think what we'd like to do reports that is you suppose that people want to. I think what so um, Chris, Chris as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I should just, I just say if anyone's got any questions after this, I, I wrote most of what you're talking about. So I think <laughs> And I think also, we, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about at the next partner forum meeting, which will be in March, is actually having a session that actually asks a bit more expli explicitly of people who actually use the data, how that data should be presented. Under, you know, because there is a heck of a lot of data, like as Rebecca said, there's a heck of a lot of data, but actually, how do we present that in the most use useful way before, during, and after a course? Um, it's something I think we, should, we could um, give some more attention to. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> a couple of comments. Um, so, from a point of view of honing your argument under repeat runs, um, are, are you familiar with the Crouch and Mazur paper that this gave 10 years of data on Mazur's developments of clicker in the classroom? One of the interesting things from this uh, graph is that when he changed the new method, he doubled, doubled the amount they'd learned on the <coughs> But the other interesting thing is over the next eight or nine years, it went up to triple. And that illustrates that uh, it's one thing to have a, a, a transformative pedagogic idea, and it's another to gradually develop the little yeah. tweaks that increase so much it can have the same size effect. So yeah. that will be the, a, the corollary of that, of course, is that you need ways of measuring educational outcome, which we don't have, although we've got measures, obviously, of retention and of social engagement. Yeah, all of that. But the point is, I think that's. Uh, an argument you might use to encourage yeah. people to do repeat runs is that actually they have, they have to expect the course will seriously get better. Um, and we've seen that. Yeah. I mean, the courses now that are in the fourth, <coughs> some that are in the fourth run, um, they have seriously got better by any sort of qualitative measure. They've seriously got better. Yeah. Just so there's a bit of a tension between that and, and us doing more of them, more of them, or repeating them more often. Because, you know, we haven't got the time to. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean that's taken for granted, or at least take, uh, I'm yeah, taking it for granted, that everybody's got though, constraints which they can't. Do you just want to look as if you're doing something new, yeah. or do you yeah. actually want to deliver better quality? Yeah. And that's yeah. evidence a bit on the side that even the very best ideas, yeah. uh, adding more investment in what's already winning, may have you know, really measurable yeah. value. Yeah. And I think I have to say that Future Learn as a company now realises that you know, universities can't just keep running courses um, on no money, they need to have the resources to do it. So there's a recognition of that. And so one side of the equation is how can you run courses more efficiently and effectively, uh, uh, including how can we help with you know, uh, representing a course, um, and we've got you know, now a much better arrangement for um, uh, runs of courses and for copying from one course over to another. But the other side of it is what's the added value of doing that uh, and trying to enhance the added value of doing a rerun. And as you've said, you know, there are examples of rerunning uh, a teaching intervention that really does make a sizable difference. And if you can then show that you've done that on a MOOC, you can then say, well, maybe we can do this on a master's course or an undergraduate course. That's 
really helpful. Thank you. So moving on to our last uh, 15 minutes, uh, I thought there were two things we could do. One, you can just run over some of our current plans for the next events. Um, and hear from you about any other ideas you have about uh, what you'd like to do. And then any other comments about the day. So um, those of you who are in Southampton more or less, we came up with kind of agenda of sorts of things that people would like to do, uh, which we yeah, are quite lucky <laughs> because these ideas change when people involved uh, get, get involved in doing the detailed plan. Um, there is a plan for a meeting in late April. It's going to be on the topic of mu moots and museums. Uh, we have some indicative dates, uh, something like 22nd or 24th of April. This is not fixed yet uh, because we have to find a venue. Uh, do you want to say any more about that particularly? <coughs> so the initiative day? came from Leicester, um, who, as you know, have got very strong um, museums learning um, and museums research um, uh, expertise. So they've got a lot of connections, particularly with the London museums. So the reason there's some uncertainty at the moment is where um, they were hoping to find one of the museums as a, as a venue. Um, and we're still in discussion about that. But we've got a backup venue, which you'll all be pleased to know is Camden. Um, so if we can't get a museum, at least we can go to the Open University um, offices in Camden to, to hold the... Uh, what they were very keen to have it in London so that they could attract people from the London museums um, to join in as well. So it will be very broadly on museums, but also cultural partners as well, so British Library and any other cultural partners. So it's a, an opportunity for you perhaps to bring in some other people into this who've got um, interest in uh, the cultural aspects, um, uh, social aspects of learning, um, cultural partnerships. So um, have a think about that, uh, whether there's other people within your institution that you could bring into the next plan meeting. Um, the second sort of thing we said we would uh, try to do was some event that would involve uh, research students. <coughs> I've been talking to uh, various people and there's a bit of uncertainty that people have about whether um, PhD students is the right audience for this, whether if we broadened it out to students doing masters, um, the Senate Club in Southampton, they would have about five. PhD students, but they're going to have your students doing master's projects that might like to be involved. So the idea we've had about that is we run an annual conference in Milton Keynes at York University in the Institute of Educational Technology, and I thought for that is that we would add on an extra day, which would be um, students of MOOCs, that kind of doctoral symposium, thought for that at the moment is maybe rather than presentations so much that we would do something poster based but that's open to change. I haven't quite set a date for that yet from my expectation that it would be late in early June and if I'm just got any ideas for it. And that would be jointly badged then OU and Flan? Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. Um, just going to say if it's going to include master students, um, it might be people have different but our master's students do their dissertation between, well, sort of early June on so the beginning of September. September. Yeah. So it would be, um, I don't know what other people feel, but um, so, so late June would be fine, but right at the start of the June might be. We can certainly look at that also. Um, we haven't fixed dates yet, and we're just meeting next week to do that generally. No, it would be great to find a way to um, make that open to online master's students as mm -hmm. well, because we have lots of Mm -hmm. yeah, that would be a good way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll explore those ideas. Um, but we are anxious to um, make use of the fact. Of the, I thought that particularly the strength of the Southampton meeting was that we got to see some of the work that PhD students do. So when we've got about, I think Rebecca and I counted up, about five people um, in the institute that are doing that. It's sort of be nice to link people up. And once we start that as a PhD student community, then we'll be quite happy. So 
uh, to take the reins and drive off in whatever direction it would like uh, to run other events. Um, and the final thing uh, that was on the stocks so was the notion around having a plan conference towards the end of 2015-15. That hasn't quite materialised in the way um, we were entirely sure what we were doing there. But there is a sort of proto version of that that I could mention in relation to EMOOCs. So, as you probably know, there's the EMOOCs conference that's coming up in Belgium in May. Uh, and uh, I've, um, I and Sian and Russell have been in, let's call it, protracted negotiation with the uh, EMOOC organisers to try and get something around the theme of social learning. Um, so that rather than say this is a future learn session in the conference to broaden it out to, towards social learning. There's been a lot of interest in doing that, but trying to pin it down has been a nightmare. What I think there's going to be is the possibility of a keynote, there's almost certainty of a panel session, and I'm hoping that there will be a um, theme within the experience track of the conference for papers around social learning as well. So there's definitely a receptive um, uh, approach from the conference organisers, so if you were to submit papers around the theme of social learning, I'm sure they would be very well received. I'll put more up on the, um, the, the Facebook groups page as soon as I've got some final um, decision from the conference organisers. There have been emails flying today that I haven't really been able to read. So it should be fairly soon that um, that will be announced, but I'm hoping there will be a panel session a keynote and a theme in that conference. Yeah. Just to let, I'm sitting, I don't know why, but I'm into the experience track committee. Good. And I'm going to see all the, the, the what do you call it, when people are applying for participate, participating. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to judge. You're this. going to be, you're a reviewer on that. Yes. Yes. So I don't know if I can influence. But <laughs> I don't know exactly how it works, but I think that if you have done something in the experience track and social learning, yep. then uh, go to the EMOOC website and yep. see when the deadline is yep. for submitting. Yep. And, and the chair of the experience track is Inga de Vord, who is also my yes. PhD student, so we ought to be able to get some influence <laughs> on that track, but it's... There's been no lack of interest and enthusiasm from her, but it's a bit, bit of a morass of treacle at the moment with the, the organisers, but I'm hoping it's getting sorted out. So. Um, yeah, mine was really just a comment, sort of almost pulling together some of the stuff that's being talked about today, which is uh, about <coughs> what discipline we're working, because it seems to me that we've been exposed to loads of interesting research today, coming from very different kind of paradigms and positions and methodological perspectives. And I just wonder whether the... The Future Learn Academic Network could be a place where we could have some more intensive discussions about method and about kind of tackling that challenge of how you work together. How does you know how does virtual learning <coughs> human approach work with learning analytics yes. approach, for example? Do you think that could be done? That thing I don't really know. I don't know, but it, it would be nice to give it some thought. Think about how we could sort of facilitate something. Well, like I think that. there are a few of us with particular interest in uh, researching and for disciplinarity anyway. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, I agree with you. The things there's so many interesting lines on the ethic that we could have followed. Mm -hmm. um, and people, interestingly, are always uh, explaining themselves from their breath, breath discipline, like Steve's comments about his background in physics, which I'm prone to do myself as well uh, when I do talk. So I, I'd like to explore that idea too. Mm -hmm. Could I throw it a bit wider? But both, is that a useful theme? If so, how? And also, are there any other themes or issues that, as the network, we could or should be exploring? Is there maybe one on how we make best use of discussions in MOOCs? I mean, certainly with Adrian mm. Wall, one of the strange things we found that if we had a discussion stack, you got more posts, <coughs> but less discussion. So there's lots of people posting to themselves, shouting into the wind of the sort of thing. And, you know, does that matter? Um, you know, is it just that the, you know, the learners will come up with their own discussions, that things that interest them? Or should we be trying to steer them, or is that counterproductive? Mm. So that would be interesting. I know that the people at Exeter 
are very keen to do research around um, dialogue and discussion. Um, so certainly you know, you'll find a receptive audience there to doing research in that area. And I imagine that there are other people here who are interested in dialogue and discussion and, and the courses. Slightly off topic, but to raise something I raised on the Facebook page, I found it um, a bit odd that there wasn't a forum for educators to discuss um, you know, common uh, well, their pedagogy, <laughs> um, because I think in one institution there may not be a critical mass of people actually interested in talking about the pedagogy, but I think across the whole future learning network we would be, um, and so. Um, I didn't do anything before Christmas, but if nothing else happens, I will set up a Facebook page and try and advertise it. It seemed to me that that's something, surely, that I, I'd hope to get out of future learning was to actually talk to other people who are interested in teaching and sort of explore the issues of this kind of interesting new way of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, when I was particularly in my education week, I'd love to have had a wider community just to say, you know, has this sort of thing happened to you and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and it does seem to me, I, I expected that to be one of the benefits, as an educator rather than someone the researcher, I expected that to be one of the benefits of future learning. So I think there's two answers to that. One is that as future learn, we could, you know, there are mechanisms that we've got and we could look at extending them. The other one is plan was set up deliberately outside mm -hmm. future learn, although connected with it, partly so that we you know, weren't seen as being controlled by future learn and we could act as a an independent but connected voice. I'm just wondering whether the best approach for exploring pedagogy is just to get on and do it, which is to try and set up something similar to PLAN but around teaching and learning. Yes, I, I raised it with PLAN because I, mm. I thought of that rather than mm. directly with future. I think in fact my Anna Sinnington's degree is possibly more directly. So. Well, I can say I, 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 I don't see why we shouldn't do that. I mean, yeah. I think the link between research and practice <laughs> this is one that you would want to cut. So, yeah. so I think we should have a pedagogy discussion. Do you think we should do it as part of FLAN, yeah. or do you think we should set up a separate forum, or just another Facebook group link well, to FLAN? What would you, how would, what would you think would well, be best? Face, I mean, not, not everyone likes using Facebook, so I mean, I have colleagues, mm. even though it's an information school, I have colleagues who really don't like, who don't use Facebook. Mm. But I mean, the easy option is to set up a Facebook page. Um, I suppose pu publicising it, if FutureLearn was willing to publicise yes. the fact that it yeah. Yeah. I think we, I, mean, I, I think also, I mean, I, I don't think we do enough of a job of actually publicising FLAN. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, um, yeah. so but in terms of both publicising FLAN and publicising something else, um, I would certainly... So I'm happy to be <laughs> saving an administrator on a Facebook page. Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, I raised it a couple of times, so I'm willing to do something about it. But, but I, I, I don't, I'm not the best person to actually tell everyone that's no. educating on future learning. I think what the best thing to do actually after this is I'll talk to Anna mm. at Sheffield, and then we can mm. think about it. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. I, suppose in, 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 I think also research ideas might come out of those conversations. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a plus one, really, for... <laughs> John's idea about the, the method and the methodology. Because I think certainly, you know, I, I come from a ground theory perspective focusing on communities. And I, sometimes I look at all this and I feel a little bit, okay, well, I didn't see myself in the lists. Mm -hmm. But I think by having methodological discussions, you can actually promote collaboration and cooperative research mm -hmm. between institutions, you know, either by coming from different approaches or by coming from close scale mm -hmm. I don't know what other people are, what their approaches are. It's almost like you need some kind of specialist facilitation for those kinds of discussions to happen. I just wonder if who's out there that could do that. But I can dig around. I'll dig around and see. So it doesn't descend into a holy war. I mean, I think most of us are here because we're interdisciplinary in one sense or another. So I don't think it's going to be you know, qualitative clashes with quantitative, I think. There's a huge opportunity to explore interdisciplinary methods across disciplinary yeah, methods. So, my, yeah. my experience, though, is that if you don't have a product that you're working to, it can descend into mm. you know, yeah. That's why I keep that territory yeah. wars. If yeah. you have to produce something out of the discussions, you get on with it. Yeah. So, so we might even look at some, something that could be produced out of a series of discussions mm. to keep us on track. Which is another question about what sort of things could come out. So one sort of thing are joint research 
is another sort of thing which is already happening is joint papers from a number of partners um, and there's been a huge willingness to share data across partners to do comparative studies and I think that's something we should really encourage uh, uh, another thing could be a position paper or a manifesto that came from plan at some point around the approach that we're taking particularly around the methods mm -hmm. so it might be worth thinking about what sort of things what sort of outputs um, as well as what sort of processes I think one thing that builds on from that that we're trying to do in Trinity in an institutional scale at the minute is we're trying to come up with one or two key research questions that everyone can start looking at and contributing mm -hmm. to. I don't know how easy that would be within this context, but are there one or two big questions we'd like to try and solve to do with MOOCs? A good question. <coughs> so a big question. I'm not answering it. I'm not, well, I'm not I think it's something, <laughs> so let's, let's put that, there you go, something to be continued on the uh, Facebook um, groups page, I think, what are the big questions that we want answered around MOOCs? <coughs> We've got a couple of minutes, so, yes. Yeah, question on how you get on the Facebook group. Right. <laughs> um, the easiest way is to mail me and say you want to get on it, and then I, I think anybody in the group can um, uh, ask other, other people, but I know I can. Oh, so, okay. they just Thank mail me. Much. Yeah. And if anybody else is not yet on the Facebook um, it's, it's a Facebook groups page, so it's closed, uh, and it's just um, the sort of discussion that we've been having here continued online. What I will do next week is add a page on about plan to the future learn partners. Good. So Good. That's exactly what we need. Explain a bit more about what plan is, and right. also link to the Facebook. Yeah. We also have an outward-facing plan site, which um, is which I can't remember the URL, which shows how often I update it. Um, but that is essentially a WordPress site which is branded um, FutureLearn and looks quite attractive, which we can use if we want to have any public messages that we want to send from Plan. So it's there to be used. I know I can post to that. Um, I'm not trying to stop anybody else doing it, but if there's anything that you want to um, put publicly about from Plan, uh, you know, announcements for events, for example, that are open, then you can, we can use that as well. So, I think we've come to a natural uh, finish. I just want to ask you to thank Shan and her team for organizing. Allow me to take a picture. <laughs> Are you going to post it onto the <coughs> Facebook groups page? Maybe. Good. <laughs> um, that, well, that's happening. Um, there's, tea, there's tea and biscuits here, so please stick around and have a cup of tea before you <coughs> go on your way. But um, yes, stay in the Thank you. Thanks for coming.